get my thing in action To be, to see, to feel, to live Put my heart in action Burn. To run, to go, to get, to give Good day, ladies and gentlemen. This is Megan Carger with the Coda Report, and it's my pleasure to bring to you an interview with Freeman of Freeman TV, The Freeman Perspective, and The Free Zone. I spent several days visiting with Freeman and Jamie at their house in Kansas, and I would like to thank them, their housemates, and their friends for a particularly enjoyable visit. We filmed two days of conversations which range from his personal history, to Freemasonry, to aliens, to some of Freeman's more unusual and interesting conspiracy theories. We're here today in Kansas with Freeman, uh, researcher, videographer, filmmaker, radio show host, man who wears many, many hats, ex-punk rock band member. It's true. And uh, thank you for having me uh, out in your home today. Oh, it's fantastic to have you here. Uh, it, I love to share my life with you and with everyone that comes by and, and see that we're all human, right? Uh, so, Verb, I'm really glad that you came. I really just want to get started by asking, you know, what was it? That, uh, that started you on the, the research path, on this path to, to making films and to putting information out there that's, you know, quite a bit outside the, uh, the common frame of knowledge. Everything from UFOs to ancient symbolism to, you know, the colonial of Barack Obama, all kinds of interesting, interesting topics. And, and I'd like to start to maybe just with a little bit of your personal history and what brought you on this journey. Yeah, I guess one thing on that list would uh, also be experiencer. Uh, and really my story began probably before I was born. Uh, my whole family has been wrapped up in Freemasonry, wrapped up in uh, secret military operations, and then even my mom uh, running from Nazis in, in Luxembourg and Germany. And so I often tend to think that genetic memory played a line in what I do now and why I got so interested in this topic because from a very young age I have been researching UFOs, I've been researching uh, the pyramids and mysteries of Earth and you know I knew what the Antikythera mechanism was when I was 10 years old you know uh, <clears throat> and it intrigued me and as I, I studied and learned and even seemed to be experiencing, because honestly I do believe I have extraterrestrial influences in my past. Uh, me and my friends used to sit around and talk about the UFOs we'd witness and, and things of this nature, but I don't recall any of the UFOs themselves. I only recall the stories being shared. But so then I, I, I start to grow and learn and develop this new mentality about planet Earth, probably, you know, basically straight from Time Warner. <laughs> it's your Time Warner books that give you all these mysteries of the universe, right? And so the eye in the pyramid with the, is, is starting my education. I find out my father's involved in all of the things that I'm studying. And this really shocked me. You know, I had no idea that any of this was going on with Dad. And I start talking about UFOs and things, and he's like, well, you know, I was in Project Blue Book. I'm like, how could I know that? You know, you never speak to me. I, I, I finally believed that his whole life was top secret, and he had nothing to talk about. Because I later find him uh, with Jimmy Carter. <laughs> now, hold, hold that up just a moment longer okay. so that everybody can, uh, can uh, see it. Yeah, there's an arrow just pointing to Dad, and uh, then Jimmy sitting here. And I got a little closer one of Jimmy there. Uh, and they were on Killer One Submarine together, the first nuclear sub uh, to the American waters and beyond. And uh, then I find out that he was in Project Blue Book, and 
been chasing flying saucers. He was stationed on an island where he had four radar dishes, and any time a flying saucer flew over, it was Dad who called it in. But inside of all of that as well, he's worshipful master of the lodge, and so that's him getting my uh, his apron from my grandfather, who was also you know a top-ranking Freemason. Actually, when I went to the Temple of the Thirty Third. Uh, they asked me for my family name and I gave them my grandfather's name because my dad had to leave Freemasonry to marry my mom because my mom was married, I have a picture of him too, but my mom, oh here he is, my mom was married to the grand potentate of Freemasonry in, in Berlin. And so you cannot marry another worshipful master's wife in Freemasonry without disturbing the order. And so my mom fell in love with my dad and they, my mom came to America, ended up getting together with Dad, and, and so Dad had to leave Freemasonry to uh, marry my mom, you know, so it was kind of a love story as he's yanked from this occultic realms and brought back forth. So here I am, following a thread, following a story that's been just kind of bubbling up in my life with UFOs, pyramids, ancient mysteries, and then I find my mom and my dad all involved. My mom's an Eastern star, uh, which is like the female version of Freemasonry, and their symbol, of course, is an inverted pentagram, and she was Esther in the Eastern star of all things, and she therefore had a place on the pentagram in the rituals. But both her and my dad, in doing all of these rituals, thought, oh, it's a bunch of gobbledygook, it's stuff that we have to do just to get along, you know. Dad knew that to wear his mason ring in the military was going to get him a good position, he was going to rise to the top, he's going to be asked to be on Killer One, you know, with soon to be presidents, right, uh, because they, they wear these rings and these aprons. Beyond all of this, when I was ten years old, I was in a drawing competition in, in the fifth grade and I drew that picture. Uh, this, I had no idea of anything, I didn't think anything about it when I drew it. I won the, the contest and uh, but then that is the only thing I have left from my childhood. I've had everything I've ever owned taken from me, roommates moving out with all my stuff or you know, you name it, it's happened, I've lost everything that I originally had, but that picture. I, I get to college, and at this point I meet a guy I call Alistair Morrison, because he is Alistair Crowley meets Jim Morrison, rock and roll magician, right? And I end up with his entire magician's library as well. Well, he and I are in this honors course, uh, interdisciplinary studies, and, and a fantastic course, but obviously put out by the Club of Rome. Um, we were taught all philosophies and all this stuff. It was a two and a half year course that covered all your required. You didn't have to take anything but uh, math and uh, electives after that. But anyway, so I meet this guy and we, we hit it off and uh, he starts teaching me about Freemasonry. I didn't even know of this yet. I'm now, well, I waited five years between high school and college. So, you know, whatever that is, 23. Uh, and all of a sudden, he's teaching me about Freemasonry. He shows me the compass square and G, and I'm like, why is this so familiar? I recognize this symbol. And so it finally dawns on me that I used to wear my father's Masonic cufflinks as my space insignia when we played Battlestar Galactica. And, I mean, these stories all coalesce, being Battlestar Galactica being written, or the basis of the Mormon belief system that was created by Joseph Smith, who was a Freemason, right? So... Uh, here I am in college, I find out my dad uh, is a mason by that, and then start to question deeper, and this guy opened me to the doors of the esoteric realms and started, you know, my introduction to Kabbalah and to, to the tarot cards and things like that. And we ended up traveling across the U.S. together. Uh, what I, I had started making juggling sticks. I would juggle uh, batons. And uh, I was selling these as fast as I could make them. And I started thinking to myself, well, I could do this anywhere. So next thing I know, I'm making juggling sticks in the park across USA, uh, in Washington, D.C., visiting the Smithsonian, visiting all the museums, you know, things like that, and being taken all over the world. And as we begin to leave, this little black and white spotted dog jumps into the van with us. He had been sitting at my friend's house for three days, we found out afterwards. Uh, and they had named him Yin Yang. 
So little Yin Yang was going around with me while I'm juggling, and I realized that I am the fool card. Because we're going off to the abyss. I had no idea where I was going. I had no experience of, like, hippies or travelers or anything. All I knew is I had a van, and I had a method to make money. You know, these juggling sticks worked. So I just went from town to town juggling and ended up on this grand adventure, this mysterious, miraculous event that taught me that the universe is alive and well and speaking to each and every one of us and leading you, if you allow it, to this path of miraculous, divine, you feel like you're part of destiny. So now I've ended up doing performing the last uh, all-night ritual the Mayans have ever performed or the first all-night ritual the Mayans performed at the Pyramids of Tikal. I've ended up in parts that just made me feel like I was part of destiny. I've hot-tubbed with one of Aleister Crowley's relatives. I met Ken Kesey, uh, you know, Wavy Gravy and all that, you know. <laughs> just the, the full-on, I'm free. And I learned what it meant to be free. Because the universe made me free. It wasn't anything to do with money or things of that nature. Actually, people would ask me, you know, well, how did you do all this stuff? You know, oh, I was just in L.A., I was just in Washington, I was just over here. And you come back and you start telling the norms your tales, and they're astounded. You know, how can you do all this? You know, you're just a guy that, you know, juggles, and they don't even know that much. Well, it wasn't until I was questioned on that that I even realized that I was doing something out of extraordinary. And that they, they brought it out of me. They said, you know, I was like, well, wait, you know, I never thought about it. How did I go to all these places? I have no idea. I just did. And every time something would lead me to the next thing. And now I'm back here, you know. And so that whole path, and, you know, we, we kind of skipped over that artwork. We'll have to get back to that. Because the entire exopolitics of planet Earth was unveiled to me in that picture. And I didn't know. And so... Through all of this trip, okay, all of this has occurred, and I start reading deeper studies. I start realizing that Freemasonry has connections to Sirius, and that most of the tales I can find that lead to Freemasonry and their rituals are extraterrestrial in source, or at least from the gods, but even still, as you track all of this stuff, and I became more and more aware. Now, one thing I had been tracking this whole time were the merfolk of Atlantis, and this was something that I didn't see. Well, I, I hadn't read or, or been introduced to David Icke or uh, Alex Jones or any of these people yet. At this point, I'm in uh, the realms of Graham Hancock and uh, even Richard Hoagland's website, though none of his books, but I was in a different paradigm, Zechariah Sitchin and stuff like that. And so I got a hold of The Serious Mystery by Robert Temple. Right. Fantastic book. I definitely recommend it. Absolutely. One of, one of the first that I read, actually, uh, along these lines. Well, here's a guy studying merfolk, wanting to know about these mermen, mermaids of Atlantis, seeing them in all of the art and architecture and even corporate logos and things, wanting to understand, uh, wanting to understand the, the idea behind this whole thing. Well, then you open up a serious mystery and you find out it's all about the merfolk and the fish people, the nomos that come to visit this tribe in Mali, Africa. And the Dogon. The Dogon. Yeah. And they teach them even one of the things that cracked me up was uh, that they were living in, in sandcastles. And this is my artwork. So what I've done is tried to compose all of my conspiracy theories into singular arts so that I can describe a whole concept without having to bring out all the pictures. But right up top you see is the picture that I drew. And you'll see that later. But uh, here are the Dogon and, and their sandcastles, right, that they would live in. And this is Sirius above it. Well, as these, these guys were started talking about, they, they were given a symbol for Sirius by the Dogon tribe, which you will find in the Philadelphia Lodge in the ceiling of the Egyptian room. So if you go there, what you'll see is in each corner of the Egyptian Lodge, in the Egyptian portion, right, at the Philadelphia Lodge, they have both. Mm -hmm. They have the, the Templar room, they have the Assassin room, they have the, the Egyptian room, which <laughs> Zeke actually sat in the Worshipful Master's chair there, this big old emblazoned uh, with, with falcons, and you feel like this little kid in it. We all sat in it, but when Zeke sat in it, this guy came bursting through the wall 
It was a secret door panel. He'd been watching us <laughs> bursting through the wall. He's like, that's it, that's it. And he starts scolding the, the mason that was giving us the tour. I mean, we were digging behind everything. But anyway, you look up on the ceiling and you'll see the blazing star, which is the Masonic symbol for Sirius, in each corner. And then if you're standing to the, you know, the Worshipful Master's seat is here and you're standing here, look straight up and in the wood grain you'll find the Dogon symbol for Sirius. Now, I find that very intriguing, and I'm hoping to go back deeper because there's more. You've seen Code 144, right? Uh, the ma ma magnetics of, of Ed Lead Scalman compared to the, the art and architecture in the Philadelphia Lodge. Amazing. Uh, I'm hoping to get a lot of that. We went and filmed Ca Coral Castle. Anyway, uh, <laughs> the symbol that the Dogon were given to, to represent Sirius was on each of the space shuttles that I had drawn in that picture at 10 years old. Now, Robert Temple wrote that book in 1976. I drew that picture in 1977. Yeah, I don't suppose you had read that book in between those two... In Never heard of it, yeah, no. Or not, not in between 9 and 10, for nine sure. 9 and 10 years old, exactly. And this was right before Star Wars, which was a good thing. It was like, whatever message had to come through, had to come through then because otherwise those things probably would have been X-Wings. And that really speaks a lot to what Hollywood does to our minds. Disney movies say, making new memories, right? This is, they tell you, you know? They're like capturing your imagination. And we don't think these things through. You know, they're writing our own world. Into but when, when was the design and launch of the first space shuttle? Well, I did watch it launch from my backyard. I grew up in Orlando. Uh, I've watched almost all the launches, but I don't recall what year it was. Yeah. Because I, I think your drawing might even predate the first of the space shuttles. I wonder. Yeah, that's a good. Thing. And 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 they're they're clearly space shuttles. I mean, oh yeah, yeah. They've even got drawing little... the space shuttle. And, yeah. and the thing was, is I sat there and I drew those space shuttles, and you see, I put the flames down the the fuselage. You know, I was trying to make them really cool. And uh, well, I went to look at the the shuttles and I decided they all needed a symbol and and just in my childhood it, you know why do I think of this but it, I wanted a really cool symbol I really did and I sat there and I, I paused over this and I remember this specifically and then I just drew that little curved line and straight line through it and went oh man <laughs> that's not that cool you know I didn't I wasn't very appreciative of it it wasn't what I was wanting but I went ahead and I put it on each of the space shuttles so now 18 years later I'm 28 years old and I'm reading the Sirius mystery and I see that symbol in the book for Sirius and I'm in the midst of uncovering and unraveling all of this mystery right now and I'm freaking out and I run and I grab the picture because it's the only thing I have left it's the last piece of my childhood puzzle and I can lay the book and the picture side by side and you'll see it is the symbol for Sirius so now I'm going, oh wow, okay, because I had just deciphered that the blazing star was Sirius for the Freemasons, and if you go look at NASA, what's on the side of the building but a blazing pentagram, and so I actually had the symbolism correct, because it would be a, a Masonic organization is NASA, and you can't go into space if you haven't sworn at the altar, right? So now I've got this connection, and then in the other side of the drawing, I've got the winged serpent. Now, at 10 years old, I knew nothing of Quetzalcoatl, Kakukan, or anything like that, or even dragon bloodlines or things of this nature. But there was that winged serpent. And so, this ended up being the exopolitical explanation of the creation of civilization on planet Earth. That a race from Sirius and a race from Alpha Draconis, the, the giant serpent, came together to rule planet Earth in a marriage of convenience, like we do now. They were the ones that brought the concept of this divine right to rule down and also the concept of marrying kingdoms. And this came from extraterrestrial sources, if you start to believe what we're understanding about the truth of it now. So there I have the Syrians and the Alpha Draconans, but yet I had this thing in the center of the picture that I wasn't sure what it was. I personally thought it was a spiral galaxy when I drew it. And then we get a little deeper into the puzzle and, and extraterrestrials are showing themselves all over the US and all over the world 
and these trans-dimensional craft are filmed by the Columbia Space Shuttle during the tether experiment and as this tether breaks free from Columbia and starts floating down looking like a giant fluorescent bulb in space all of these little flitting flying saucers are all over it all flying around it and they're they're ovalish you know almost round but not quite with a divot in the in one side and a spiral going radiating out of the center I start watching David Serrata's explanation of this and he's talking about the hyperdimensional physics that he's deciphered from this and, and then he shows the picture of it with it all spiraling to the center and that's the picture in my picture right down to the point I, I put them side by side just for you to see that that's the craft that the Columbia Space Shuttle filmed or one of the many and that's the art uh, that you can see I even have the dip I have everything it's identical and so this blew my mind I've even in my film Columbia I have superimposed the two over each other in the film and uh, you can see they're identical so now I drew these pictures and well, guess where they show up Molly Africa they form a big circle around the <laughs> Mali Africa and you can watch them go right over the horizon but they're transparent you can see right through them hyperdimensional crap so I started to believe and wonder are these the Asgard as in Stargate uh, colloquialism uh, in that these might be the mediators or the ones that are in between these two forces that I've drawn and so this is the story that has been unfolding since then and that's how I got into this <laughs> well I've had a giant v-shaped craft fly over my car while I was visiting a uh, mason or mormon well, not really visiting but circling a mormon temple in Ogden Utah a giant v-shaped craft flew over the car uh, talk about a horrible moment as I try to film it and it's not coming out on film and here I got this TV show and everything and I can't show people the UFO that just flew over my head then I, I have to wonder about all of my extraterrestrial well, I guess I skipped one more experience. Uh, I told you about the big V-shaped craft over Ogden. That was on our way to go meet the high priest of the Church of Satan in Portland at an esoteric conference. But before that, with my friend that I was in with college, not the Alistair Morrison fellow, but our other fellow who went on to Hollywood to make movies. He's uh, one of the guys that does all the CGI. He and I were at Daytona Beach after graduation for spring break and we decided before going to the club to go and hang out at the beach for a minute. It's about 45 minutes drive from my house to the beach. And we're hanging out at the beach and it's 10 p.m. and we're sitting on a lifeguard stand. All of a sudden there's this giant rectangular craft hovering over the ocean. It's subdivided into four squares and looks like translucent light, but you can see the block of the thing. And it's just sitting there, and we're just pointing at it, <laughs> neither of us saying a word. And then I remember uh, watching my finger as it took off. I don't remember the, seeing the craft leave or anything. I just have this vision of it. And we jumped down, freaked out. Oh, my God, let's go tell everyone. You know, we got to go. And, and so we could turn around, and it's spring break at Daytona Beach. There were thousands of people walking up and down the street, and, you know, all the cars driving up and down and everything. They were only a block away from where we were. And we jump off the heart lifeguard stand, walk over to the street, and the streets are empty, completely silent. And we're going, what happened here? So we start walking down the street in this kind of twilight zone feel, wondering what happened to all the people? Did they all get abducted by this giant craft or, or what happened? We finally find out it's five hours later. We run into some kids, we find the time, and we learn that it's now 3.30 in the morning, everybody had gone home. So we lost that entire amount of time. I moved to Lawrence, Kansas later on. And then, lo and behold, there's my friend walking down the street. It turns out his girlfriend's going to KU. I'm like, what are you doing here? He comes home, tells everybody the whole story, confirms it for me, because he'd tell people these stories, and they kind of fall like a lead brick. You know, nobody really cares because they haven't experienced something as amazing as that. And he tells the whole story again without me even bringing it up, but he reminded me that on our way home, we couldn't figure out how to get home. We had been mind-wiped. We couldn't remember... We could tell that we were in my neighborhood, but didn't know what street to turn on, you know, and got home by, you know, autopilot. 
But so there was that whole experience, and that was 1993. That was the moment, the, the serious contact as well, if I note the date, the 77, uh, that was the same time that Timothy Leary and Robert Anton Wilson both made contact with Sirius. So the cosmic uh, trigger came out, right, and that, his whole contact with Sirius. And he thought he was crazy, but it was the same time. And, you know, Temple writing his book at the same time. Amazing. Uh, but in 93, after that moment, I started predicting world events. I don't know whether losing five hours of time, maybe witnessing an end of the world script, I don't know. I would love to know. I, I've led this whole story up to now, to the cloning of Barack Obama, which I laid out five years ago. You know, before I even heard of Barack Obama, I was talking about that they were going to clone mummies and bring them back. But the rest of the story lies in this, this hidden knowledge that's in my head, I believe. Because here I was. And I, I ended up moving to Lawrence, Kansas, and my first step of my hypothesis was to predict 9-11. Uh, basically, exopolitics is a recent phenomenon, and uh, mostly it's uh, Dr. Michael Sala of the Exopolitical Research Institute. And what they've done is compiled evidence and data from whistleblowers, military, uh, just contactees, whatever they could get, and they put it all together and said, what do we get? And they came up with 57 different alien species visiting and interacting with planet Earth. And they then discerned through tales, and what I find very interesting, uh, they discerned the, the two races that supposedly are ruling and, and controlling civilization on planet Earth. And we'll get into some of what we see with Canberra with Astano and Dubai and how these relate to the extraterrestrial contact and how these things but before that when they outline these two races especially the Alpha Draconans and the Syrians now Alpha Draconans as we said is the dragon and, and Sirius is a binary star system that is of uh, very much importance to the Egyptians to the Greeks to the Romans to the uh, Masons to the OTO to uh, the SRI to you know I could go on as many of the Mayans of the people that have worshipped and been discussing the star Sirius now the thing about the Dogon tribe was that they actually had astronomical data about Sirius that the, the binary star would orbit every 50 years and was the heaviest thing in the universe they said and then we find out that it's actually this massive dwarf star and it orbits 50 years. We didn't even have pictures of Sirius B while the Dogon were talking about it. And yet they don't have telescopes, they live in, in sandcastles. And so we have all of this data and evidence to suggest that there has been extraterrestrial contact. And I personally, my theory is that civilization is derived from that extraterrestrial contact and is actually the purpose of civilization. Because this has been the big question to me, you know, why are we building large hadron colliders? Why are we launching into space? What's the program here? Because once you start to get deep into it, you realize they're all also worshipping at the Freemasonic altar and, and channeling extra-dimensional extra beings and developing buildings to channel paramagnetic energies. It's, it gets bizarre. So you're like, okay, there's way more to this story. Aleister Crowley is channeling a Syrian being, or what he called an Atlantean from Sirius. Would that, would that be Lam? <clears throat> uh, Lam was first, then Awas. So uh, Lam, when he when he depicted Lam, he drew him, and he is a gray. I mean, it's a, it's a early, and, and this is, you know, uh, well, Crowley died when the Roswell crash happened, okay? So 1947 is when Crowley passed, and there's a very interesting tale as when Jack Parsons, the head of Jet Propulsion's laboratories, who was working with the Nazis and Werner von Braun to start NASA and Jet Propulsions, and uh, L. Ron Hubbard, and they're trying to raise a moon child through their nuclear uh, testing and using uh, the nuclear explosions for a catalyst to insert a god form into a child, which is a moon child. And as they are performing this, Aleister Crowley dies. And, and they believe that they actually had you know, channeled an energy that was... They were at war with Aleister Crowley at, at some points with uh, McGregor Mathers and... Maybe I'm confusing that story a little bit, but it does turn out that as they're uh, 
they're trying to channel this moon child, Alistair Crowley dies, and all of a sudden we have flying saucers dropping all into our universe. Okay, 1947. Huge, right? Everywhere. Roswell. Uh, and this... Tunguska as well. It was not around that time as Tunguska, well. Tunguska, the whole explosion, that, that gets more into my later research. Um, but yes, uh, I'm not exactly sure of the date on that one. But 1947 was a very critical year for UFOs, for all of this. We saw the newspaper headlines, and then 52 and 57 are, are another major flap years where they were flying over Washington, D.C. Now we have newspaper headlines, we have eyewitnesses, we have everything necessary to say that something flew over that we don't understand. And, <clears throat> and yet all of this is always whitewashed, thrown out in fringe and all of that, but now it's come to the forefront. Now we've got a UN alien ambassador, the NASA got uh, Linda Rothschild to be their extraterrestrial expert. Uh, the Vatican has come out and had a massive ET conference with 120 speakers to discern life in the universe. Uh, meanwhile, their Jesuit priest, uh, Gabriel jo or, uh, Benjamin Funes, uh, is the head astronomer of the Vatican and is running around all over the news going, aliens are our space brothers. They, they did not suffer original sin because they weren't born of Eve. But I would baptize them were they to come. And this is the, you know, this is the lead Vatican astronomer talking about aliens being our space brothers. And you'd think that they'd kind of like push him off to the side and go, okay, yeah, well, this is our guy, but you know, he'll, he'll stay in the lab. No, they attach him to CERN and make him the lead expert with Gabriel Giante, another Jesuit priest, to attach themselves with CERN looking for the dark universe, looking for the anti-universe, as they called it. And they're sending up in the next space shuttle mission the AMS, the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, the couple with CERN's experiments, which is this large uh, particle accelerator colliding particles trying to find the God particle, but can also create strangelets and rogue black holes and all kinds of madness that might just cause havoc on planet Earth. And their corporate logo is 666 with a hyperdimensional portal. You can go look at CERN's own logo for yourself and tell me if that's not true. And then they attach this alien ambassador priest from the Vatican astronomers uh, into this uh, CERN. <laughs> so. Now they are sending and launching in the, in the Space Shuttle 134 mission up there, the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, to see the dark universe. And, and this is where we're at now. And we'll build up to this story. Because I, I, this is the footnotes, you know, you just can't help it. All of this is going on right now. I mean, this is today. This is news headlines today. Well, yeah, I mean, you just had, you know, um, I, think, I think it was Stephen Hawking come out and say, you know, if there's aliens out there, um, Proverbs is better if we're not in contact with them, you know, because, you know, they'll be potentially uh, so far ahead of us that uh, we would have the same sort of reaction that, um, that people Native Americans. or that people in the Philippines had uh, in places, you know, isolated islands in, in South Pacific had when, when they saw, you know, people flying planes and, and, you know, and they were dropping spam and stuff and they started, you know, building these, these airplane sort of uh, mock airplanes in wood and, and and you know hoping that the gods would come back and drop more spam right. you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. and that's of a critical importance as well because we need to question first of all why there is the civilized and then the originals or you know what we've called the aboriginals or the bush people or whatever uh, why is the, there this massive separation? Why have the aboriginals not come out of the, the fire building and have iPods, right? And we have. What, what caused that separation? And then there's also the critical question of uh, their worship or the fact that we're landing now helicopters in places in the Amazon uh, and, and seeing people that have never seen helicopters, right? And they're worshiping them as gods, right? As you're saying. Then we're still discovering mammals on the surface of our planet. That means that there could be life, sentient life living under the oceans that we're completely unaware of. There could be sentient life all over the regions that we have yet to see. Uh, 
That, well, this, this is why overpopulation is such an incredible myth, you know. Yeah. We're, yeah, we're clustered in a small area, and you know, if, if you stick all the animals in one pen and you make them live in their own crap, then there's too many animals in one pen, but the, this, this place is huge and, 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 and so little explored, and when people get into the wilderness, you see, you know, tons and tons of reports of, of, of yetis, of Bigfoots, of, you know, dozens and dozens of, of these sorts of creatures, and and yet it, it's discounted, you know, as though people are hallucinating, you know, and, and, and it, right. when you have such disparate cultures coming up with the same sightings, and now they have done, maybe you know a bit more than I do about these sort of gnome things that they're seeing all over South America. Yeah, we start finding that many of our myths were truths, and uh, that was a lot of the things that I learned in my early studies of this through Time Warner, through their you know mystery books, and you'd see the little man who was found mummi mummified meditating inside of a rock, like they were uh, blowing out the the mine, and they blew off the face of a rock, and there's a man, twelve inches high, in a lotus position, mummified inside the rock. You know things like this that. <clears throat> spurred my imagination and, and my my quest for this knowledge uh, were things like that. Look at like Michael Cremo's um, Forbidden Archaeology and there's you know for anybody that's interested a fascinating book on anomalous archaeology and and he's just giving you case studies he's not giving you anything really more than this is the case study from this anomalous artifact this is the and it's very this dry. book is enormous. Yeah, it's right there. Ah uh, yes, yes, and 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 you know, I'm, I'm gonna for anybody that can sit and look at all these case studies, I would I would recommend that it's it's not you know it's not one of these reads where he's gonna give you all his suppositions about it, which right. he does have, but just the facts. If you're interested in just the facts, that's a great great book to go to. Yeah, and so now we're looking at uh, a civilization of humanity, Homo sapiens, existing on planet Earth for two hundred thousand years, by the the roughest estimate, by the closest. Uh, he would probably say a million or more. I mean, our planets, I don't remember how many millions of years. Whether it was Homo sapiens or some other sentient species capable of doing things like making fine gold chains and then having lost it so long ago that it's now embedded in a block of coal. Right, exactly. You can't deny these things. The Antikythera mechanism is another one. There are 33 different gears and, and reversing gears and things that, you know... But now we're to the point of time travel, too, so that all really gets uh, mixed mixed up. Um, so before I, I transcend into the, the data, um, well, I guess we've, we've covered the exopolitics in a way. They've, they've developed this study that came with 57 different alien species. Now, the reason I got into some of the ideas of them still being on planet Earth is that these greys, such as Lom, that, that Alistair Crowley channeled, uh, might be subterrestrial and not extraterrestrial. Mm -hmm. So they could have existed on planet Earth, and this tale actually fills the the true spectrum of Zechariah Sitchin's twelfth planet. Now, let me just say I've heard Arizona Wilder say that he's showing up at the lizard rituals and all of this. I've seen him, uh, you know, giving the Masonic handshake to Gordon Jordan Maxwell. I don't know what to think about all that. Uh, I take the knowledge that I gain and I also balance it with everything else that I've been studying because he's not talking about Atlantis, but I will fit Atlantis into the puzzle. Or, you know, I take a cross interdisciplinary study and bring this more. I bring the story out more. And so Zechariah Sitchin gives us this 12th planet and the idea of the gods coming to planet Earth. Well, they brought with them a race they called the, or, uh, the, uh, the, Elo uh, <laughs> the Anunnaki. Yeah. Okay, so it wasn't the Anunnaki that came to planet Earth, and this has been a bin, big misunderstanding uh, from people who read Sitchin but didn't really read it. Because as you read it, you, you'll find that the Anunnaki were a race that the Elohim brought with them. So the Elohim came down to Earth, according to you know, Sitchin calls them the Elohim. But the, the those that came down. The those that uh, Earth moved from heaven. And then there were so many designations for the Anunnaki, or the GG. And See, that's where, okay, that's where you got to be careful, because even Sitchin ends up cross-correlating these two things, but in his, in his first book, in The Twelfth Planet, as he's discerning the idea of these gods coming down to planet Earth to mine this planet for resources, uh, trapped uh, a renegade race, you know, hiding from the Galactic Federation or whatever was going on with them, 
uh, I guess, uh, well, they brought with them a race they called the Anunnaki. Yeah, uh, Anunnaki. And so now, as the story unfolds, we find out they're geneticists, and that they have come here, and they can manipulate genes and DNA, and that they, but if you understand that they brought a race with them to mine the planet, then a geneticist would design an ant-like person. If you wanted, uh, you would uh, an almost sentient, somewhat biological computer ant-like person, and you would use them because they would easily tunnel live underground. Well, look at the grays. They are completely this ant-type person with the big bulbous head, the dark eyes, little nose, little ears for subterranean travel, skinny little spindly gray arms. Uh, they are subterranean. And so now we have this subterranean race, the Anunnaki, which the Hopi called the Anasazi, which is not too far off from Anunnaki, and they called them the ant people that, that rescued them in the time of Great Cataclysm and brought them into the subterranean realms. Well, with the Anunnaki being a grays, being the grays, being a subterranean race that revolted against the Elohim, the gods, Enki, Enlil, and Ninhart, Sag, and all, and went deep into the earth. And these gods could do nothing about it. And they weren't subterrestrials. And so that led to the creation of mankind, as we know it today, right? The manipulation of the hominid species on planet Earth, be it that we were degenerated or you know, increased in intelligence. I don't know how to take that whole story. But they had crafted a race they called the Lulu, which mm -hmm. was the dark-headed ones. Yeah, yeah. Now, as I go through my Masonic studies and I find all these other connections to this extraterrestrial sources, I got one more connection I'll get to a Sitchin. When you go and you go into a Shriner's Lodge and you look at the Fez, you will see the words Lulu, right? So they're, they're, they're like actually honored to be the slave race of the Elohim, uh, the Lulu. Well, if you, if you look at the, the indications, is that the difference between, um, you know, the, the Lulu and the Adamu is, is that the Lulu are um, mules, they're sterile. Exactly, exactly. And that's when you get to the story of Adam and Eve, right? Because what is the Bible but a lineage of Adam and Eve, right? And so... In some ways, if you wanted to kind of read into it, you could say the Bible is the tale of the first humans that could reproduce from the mule race, the Lulu, that they had crafted. And so I find it amazing that I'm seeing Lulu all over, and then there's Hulu, who openly admits that they're reptiles trying to eat your brain. All right, so the human blue, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I saw the I saw the ad for that. Um, that I don't the, know I don't know how it was that I saw it, but it was one of these one, things that somebody one and, pulled and, in and. Hello, Earth. I'm Alec Baldwin, TV star. You know, they say TV will rot your brain. <laughs> That's absurd. TV only softens the brain like a ripe banana to take it all the way. We've created Hulu. Hulu beams TV directly to your portable computing devices, giving you more of the cerebral gelatinizing shows you want anytime, anywhere, for free. I only <laughs> Mushy mush. And the best part is there's nothing you can do to stop it. I mean, what are you going to do, turn off your TV and your computer? <laughs> Once your brains are reduced to a cottage cheese like mush, we'll scoop them out with a melon baller and gobble them right on up. Oops. I think I'm drooling a little. Because we're aliens. And that's how we roll. Hulu, an evil plot to destroy the world. Enjoy. They have three of them out, one with uh, Dennis Leary, one with Alec Baldwin, and one with that girl, I can't think of her name, a Mouseketeer. Uh, but yeah, you know, so here's Hulu, and then Lulu.com, and, and you know, I always, man, you find this in all of the uh, symbolism that you see around you, and we'll get deeper into that, but one other connection that tied just, you know, beyond the Lulu on all their hats, to Freemasonry, to the... Okay, so now, now the hypothesis is that Freemasonry is the priestcraft that was cultivated to continue the operations of mining this planet for resources. And that is why civilization does what it does. Because once you get to the root of civilization, I challenge you to go to the head of any corporation, to the beginning of any movement in the world, French Revolution, American Revolution, Bolshevik Revolution, Nazism, uh, you name it, you know, uh, the trains, planes, automobiles, 
look to the top, who's at the top? But a worshipful master or a Freemason, a thirty-third, thirty-second degree Mason. Yeah. Someone, someone, and and even and even in you know other other areas, they'll be associated with uh, one or another of the secret societies. So if it's if it's an area that has has different you know form of secret societies, and yet you see them all com all um, going back to the same thing, whether it be the Chinese who, you know, are descended of the dragon gods, mm -hmm. who have a divine right to rule because they're demigods, or, you know, the Greeks who have a divine right to rule because they're demigods, or the Trojans, and, you know, and this god chose this side, and this god chose that side, and, and you can follow the symbols, like you were saying. I have um, recently picked up, uh, when I was, uh, was in Turkey and Greece this summer, I picked up uh, couple of reproductions of certain coins uh, that were used and they're, they're accurate reproductions of the ancient coins and of course on the Trojan coin is the B uh, right yeah. and you know we, Paris is Paris because Paris is the Trojan prince and you know the Merovingian bloodline is, is descendant of the Trojan uh, monarchy and, and, and you know there you have the beehive and the three bees again you know right. and then you see uh, you know um, the other side in the Trojan War with the, with the goddess, right? You know, Athena and the owl, and you know, then that goes back to, to and so it's unbelievable. And then you see, you know, these these symbols, you know, from from these from these sort of uh, you know different alignments with these different gods and or extraterrestrials, if you like, you know, being displayed now, so that you know we have that little owl on our dollar bill or or whatnot, and mm -hmm. which is not Molek. <laughs> Let me just make that clear. If you get to this information and you start to realize that your leaders are dressing up in red and black Ku Klux Klan uh, outfits and worshiping a 40-foot stone owl burning baby effigies in front of it, when you, when you realize that these are who your leaders are, and you turn to Alex Jones to show you the film of this ritual going on with all of the leaders there, He'll tell you that it's Molech, okay? The reason that Alex Jones selected Molech to say this is that uh, was because this was the only God form he knew of that they burnt babies to. And being somewhat of a biblical Christian, he hadn't expanded his ideas into other mythos and other cultures and didn't realize that the owl is our goddess. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... And, and also that, that so many of the Christian rituals have to do with the goddess. Uh, you look at the the Easter eggs. Eggs were the eggs were dyed red originally because they were dyed in the blood of the sacrifice. The sacrifice which was conceived on the Vestal Virgin nine months before, you know, and and the ritual or not nine months before, but one year before. On the same day, they conceived on the Vestal Virgin, and then the three-month-old baby, which you know, nine months plus, you know, and. And then that baby is, is, and then the eggs are dyed in that, and, and, and it goes back to, it goes back to Tammuz, it goes back to Semiramis, it goes back to Babylon, and of course all the Babylonian stuff goes back to Sumeria, and they, they say directly that that's where they're taking it from, and, you know, I mean, even have the, the two translations on certain uh, texts where one side is, is in the Sumerian and the other is in the Akkadian or in the Babylonian. Right. Sorry. No, that's quite all right. Uh, you're leading me in many directions because when you look to Semiramis, you find that uh, archetypal mer goddess, the fish goddess, you know, Starbucks logo with the pentagram. And you can't see it these days, but when you see those things up by her head that uh, you think are her hands, those are her ankles. Okay? And this is how they used to explain sex with the fish people. Because they were like, well, they must have a split tail, right? That's the only way. So they call it Skyla, and that is Starbucks logo. And once you start to realize that all of the symbolism that you see around you actually pertains to the inner rituals of Freemasonry, that's when the clues just open up for you all over the place. And you have to have enough understanding of their rituals and the signs and symbolism, which is Kabbalah, which takes you to Hebrew. So you have to be able to understand. So when you look at the space shuttles <coughs> alone, okay, the Columbia endeavor for the discovery of Atlantis and the Challenger is destroyed, right? This is not happenstance. This didn't just happen. They, they, they entitled these. Now, there was, of course, Enterprise as well, the space shuttle, but this was inserted by Richard Hoagland, who started a major campaign to say, we need an Enterprise in our, in our new Navy, the space shuttles. 
And so the Enterprise was not initially in the uh, titles of the space shuttle. It was Columbia Endeavor for Discovery of Atlantis, Challengers Destroyed. Um, this is all purposeful, and every single sign and message that you see around you from the golden arches to the sun sign on target have purpose and meaning within uh, a Masonic ritual. So, and within the, the history. And so now we have our goddess, Queen Semiramis, who is uh, the, the lead founder of Babylon, right? Her and Nimrod. Uh, and, and Athens and you know I mean well then the, the goddess transfers she comes yeah. along she becomes Ishtar she becomes Isis she becomes Minerva Athena all the way up into Colombia who mm -hmm. is America's goddess or Britannia in, in, in England um, this fish goddess the mer goddess she is always shown as Venus and she's shown coming up out of a shell and of course this is shells logo and then she's symboled by a pentagram because Venus makes f a five-pointed star every eight years uh, as viewed from Earth. And this is what you're told when you are raised as a master mason inside of the lodge. So right after you end up, I, I got a one shot of my dad I could show you right after the ritual where you can just see he's, you know, he's transcended. Um, when you are raised as the worshipful master, and I'll show you in that picture, there's a pentagram behind you. Well, it's in front of you, behind the Worshipful Master, and he raises you. Now, one thing I wanted to say was that in the Masonic ritual, you are pretending to be this character, Hiram Abiff. And Hiram Abiff is this mysterious worker that came with King Hiram of Tyre to uh, build Solomon's Temple to house the Ark of the Covenant. Now, what is the Ark of the Covenant? So, we look at the Ark of the Covenant, and we find a man called Moses following a UFO to a mountain where a burning bush then tells him how to design the proper stones to place into a golden acacia box that is a perfect electromagnetic conductor and use it as a weapon of mass destruction against their enemy, right? Let's be clear what the Ark of the Covenant is. You can talk about the Ten Commandments being housed in there and whatever, but when you look to the true story, you find Moses going up the mount after following a column of smoke and a column of fire, right? And he goes up to the mountain, he meets with the Lord, uh, whichever Lord you want to put in there, right? And he, uh, he is given the directions to craft stones. And he does this himself, but no, God does it, it translates for him, right? Because Moses knew the language of God, and this was one of the rarities for him. He came down the mountain with these stones and nothing happened. Okay, so he's sitting there and he sees them worshipping the golden calf. He melts down the golden calf, and we all know what happens when you melt gold. It turns into liquid, but not in the Bible. It becomes powder, which takes us to the ideas of transforming to monoatomic mono gold. Monoatomic gold, yeah. Then he goes back up the mountain, meets with the Lord of the mountain again. And this time the Lord says, well, you have to do it yourself. And so he says, all right, all right. And he crafts the stones himself. He brings them back down the mountain. This time they radiate. This time they show an, a glow that is beyond. And from that moment on, Moses has to wear a veil over his face. He stashes these things into this perfectly sized, uh, you know, very dimensional. When you read the Douay Bible, it has the exact dimensions of the Ark of the Covenant and how to put this together. He put in a few more things like the staff and the rod and, and, and laid those things in there. And all of a sudden it becomes a weapon of mass destruction that they have to cover all in hides because anyone that gets near it dies of radiation poisoning. It gets stolen from them according to Graham Hancock, brought all around Ethiopia and ended up with the Falashas. And uh, every time a king would open this they'd die of a withering disease where they lost their hair and sores came. Well so finally they were like give it back to the Jews, right? And, uh, and so they have to bring in Hiram, King Hiram of Tyre, in order to build a building that's capable of housing this weapon. And he brings with him this strange man, Hiram, another Hiram. So we've got Hiram and Hiram coming out of Tyre. In the Bible, he's known as Hiram the Copper Worker, but in Masonic lore, he's Hiram Abiff. And he actually has a place in Walt Disney World, if you want to see. Uh, on the Thunder Mountain. Yeah, they've got the Hiram Abiff working tools. If you, you know, and like, ah, man, when you look, it's everywhere. And Walt Disney was the original Demolay. He was one of the first. Started right here in Kansas City. Uh, so, Hiram... King Hiram of Tyre is one that Zechariah Sitchin lists as having left the planet. Everybody misses that sentence because I'm, I'm attuned to Freemasonry. 
So when I see Hiram and I see, you know, I'm like, who, you know, what's going on here? So I caught the one sentence that he put in there to say that King Hiram Attire was like e Enoch or like uh, Ezekiel and had been taken off the planet. And I was like, well, psh, there's another extraterrestrial connection to Freemasonry. Another point to this is that King Hiram of Tyre is the description that people use to say Satan fell from heaven. Because the concept of Lucifer does not exist in the Bible. There is no tale in the Bible of this great superior angel that was so beautiful and beloved of God that he wanted to be as the Most High and fell to earth. That story is not in the Bible. Anyway. Nowhere. And the word Lucifer did not occur in the Bible until the King James Version, which I believe was written by Sir Francis Bacon, as is nom de plume, Shakespeare. Well, Satan and Lucifer are completely two different things. I mean, Lucifer was, 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 was the light that preceded the light of God. So Lucifer is, is Venus, the, 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 the morning light. And, and to this day, in a number of languages, if you ask for a Lucifer, you will receive a match. Exactly. Okay, so let's have a look at that, shall we? Lucifer is Venus, who is Isis, and we have this merfolk goddess that is connected with Sirius, right? Because Isis in the Egyptian pantheon was Sirius. And now, uh, the Egyptian obelisk, or the Egyptian symbol or hieroglyph for Sirius is an obelisk, a dome, and a pentagram. Now, you go down to the capital of uh, Texas, Austin, Texas, and they have the clock tower, which Charles Whitman shot many people from, uh, a statue of George Washington right there, a fine Freemason in his apron. Uh, and just in front of that is the goddess Columbia. It says Columbia on the boat that she's being drawn forth by fishmen riding fish horses. And actually that's her right there and on the official Freeman mouse pad. But so you see the Starbucks logo, uh, the comparison with the, with the goddess. In, in ancient Egypt she was the Pentagon pentagram goddess that was created or asked to go slaughter all of mankind and then Ra fell guilty and turned her into Hathor. But the mermen are busy pulling our goddess Columbia with her angel wings off into uh, the future and behind them and then that's George Washington is the golden big red phallus, right? But the obelisk and then directly due north of that is the Capitol Dome with the goddess standing on top of it holding a pentagram. So you have a, a bigger than life-size hieroglyph of Sirius as our capitals. Everywhere. Right? Uh, then you realize that she is this fallen angel and you see that on at this statue, which is right where they house Aleister Crowley's Book of the Law, where he channeled the Atlantean Awas at the pyramids, it, it, the official written hand script is at the Harry Ransom Center, right next to this goddess. And to her left and to her right is a pentagram in a ship. Now these were placed there in 1933 by a, an Italian Freemason who designed this for the uh, other Freemason, I can't think of his name. Uh, the pentagram and shell. You're, you're back to Texaco and shell. Well, when you start to decipher the corporate logos around you, you realize that all of the major players are involved in this game that you're unaware of. And if you're not aware of this game, then you don't realize how you're being programmed, conditioned through mythology. And to the point where, when I learned about the American Revolution, it was through a film by Walt Disney that they showed me in class about the Sons of Liberty, right? Our goddess, again, right? The Freemasons, the Sons of Liberty. And it showed us how all these great men came together to throw off the shackles of monarchy and to give us freedom by tossing tea into the bay. Completely ignoring the fact that they had all just walked out of a Mason temple. Because they were all Masons, every last one of them. Paul Revere to Benedict Arnold, they are all Masons. And they came together and they performed a mythological event. <laughs> we could call it what we call now false flag terrorism. And so the Boston Tea Party was nothing more than that. And when we then learn that all of the first presidents were Freemasons up to the first 13, I can pull you out the Masonic Holy Bible and show you the list. I can show you their lodges. They were all members of the Freemasons. Then you take the fact that once you take the Freemason level to presidency, then you take lineage and you realize, oh my God, all these guys are actually related. 
So did we actually really displace the monarchy? Did we just give it a new face, a new sheen, and change monarch every four years or eight? So you realize that these masons were actually after a system. And so the system has to keep going. And to the point where we were talking about the different races of the Anunnaki and the Elohim, that, that makes the Greys kind of a, a un, unwanted ally because they also are against whoever are the controllers, right? And revolted against them. And sometimes I think that the whole crossbreeding program that we hear about with abductees, and I studied that in depth, uh, would be a program for them to exist on the surface. Now, we live in amazing times, and, and things are going on that people are completely unaware of and just not paying attention to. I mean, they're in the news, but when you don't have the right perspective, you don't know how to look at what you're seeing. So when the newspaper announced on December 18th, 1999, USA Today, across the front page, Muslims stop the Freemasons from capping the Great Pyramid with gold. When people see that headline, it's just right past them. And well, people assume that gold is decorative, but they don't understand. Gold is the non-corruptible metal. Gold is the metal that does not rust. It's, it's the most purely brilliant, perfect conductor of electricity because it does not corrode. They use it for the electronics and the space shuttle. All of the most important electronics don't have silver because silver oxidizes. They have gold. And so you're taking something that's, that's already energetically um, designed in terms of, 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 of creating an energy and you want to cap it with the most conductive material, you know, that, that doesn't corrode and is going to stay, you know, brilliantly and perfectly conductive, you know, there, there's obviously an agenda behind that. I'm not sure what it is. Well, we have some clues. Okay, so we've discussed the Large Hadron Collider, CERN. Now, the titles of their colliders are Atlas, the King of Atlantis, and Alice, as through the portal, right? Well, there's also two colliders in America, and it's the Relativistic Heavy Ionic Collider, or what's called RIC. And the RIC has two colliders as well, and they are known as Phoenix and Star. Now, these are the code names Alistair Crowley used inside of the OTO. Now, when I went to speak with the High Priest of the Church of Satan, Rex Diabolus Church in Portland, now, I honestly didn't know I was going there to speak to him at the time, and that's when the big V-shaped craft flew, or one of my favorite stories, you know. Oh, yeah, last weekend, what did I do? Oh, yeah, I was going to Portland, had a big V-shaped craft fly over my car as I went through a Mormon temple and met the high priest of the Church of Satan, who told me about his device to open a portal for the old ones to enter. And I thought, oh, curious, <laughs> what does a Satanist think about, right? We want to know these things. Here's a guy with horns and, and uh, you know, piercings and dresses in all black leather with the inverted pentagram. Very, you know, very gothic. And uh, what does he think about? Building a portal to open a dimension for the Cthulhu, which are the fish monsters of H.P. Lovecraft, to wreak havoc on planet Earth for Armageddon. He calls it his Ragnarok engine. <laughs> Yeah. Ah, uh, yes. So he probably is. He probably has got a tax exemption from the government as well, doesn't he? <laughs> I wouldn't doubt it. Uh, he does sleep in a sarcophagus and doesn't get up till night, so you know what? Uh, he's a, uh, yeah. Uh, but when you realize, okay, wait, wait, wasn't Jack Parsons a Satanist, or at least a good member of the OTO, the Ordo Templi Orientis, or the Order of the Eastern Templars, uh, the ones that are into gold and arches? And uh, wasn't uh, Warner von Braun in the SS? And, you know, wasn't all of NASA worshipping the Masonic altar? And you start to realize that... And, and the connection with the, the Tool Society and the, uh, and, the, and, the, and the Knights Templar, in addition to the Knights um, uh, Teutonic Knights as well. Right. right. Which brings you all back to the, the, the Ark of the Covenant and all of that. Uh, well, so you see that Satanists... Okay, and when I was at this conference, it was Satanists, Rosicrucians, uh, OTO, and Masons, all there for an esoteric conference. And I'll tell you, the Satanists and Masons, they get hand in hand. They have no problem with one another, you know, everything. Yeah, we understand. Uh, 
That's all I can say from experience. But what I realized now was, okay, the Satanists are the high technological uh, adherents. And so they were the ones that brought us the cathode ray tube, trying to make a, a portal to the other side, trying to see the, the paranormal dimensions. And now we have TV. Well, then you start to realize that NASA and all these other organizations, CIA, NSA, take it that way too. They're all from these occult orders. Skull and Bones has given us, you know, Skull and Bones number one or Skull and Bones number two for our presidents. And they're all channeling entities through magical ritual. Well, and, and they're their aspirations lie to opening portals to allow these sort of inspirations to come through. And here we have the Phoenix and Star, which are absolutely, Phoenix was Crowley's secret name. And what are they doing? But they're colliding gold particles together and finding disparities in space-time. So the relativistic heavy ionic collider collided two gold particles and they folded, or they're not too sure what they did, but they caused space-time not to be right anymore. That much they know. That's what you can do with gold, right? And on top of that, you can... You can't travel through space without it. You couldn't have your shields, your visors, your electronics, and all of these things. And so you gotta wonder why Yahweh was so insistent on them, you know, stealing everyone's gold, or if you go further back, Enki and Enlil and their obsession with gold, and you get to the Mayans, and that's an especially amazing tale when you, well, not the Mayans, but the, the Aztecs, once you get to, to Cortez's arrival. And but even, even sorry, I'm going to interrupt, but if you look at that, I mean, even in modern times, the obsession with, of, of modern monarchs, and, 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 and when I say modern monarchs, I mean, of course, the banks with gold, right? King George who is, you know, the, uh, for those who uh, are in Europe here who don't know the American history that well, when we, when we rebelled uh, against England, King George was in charge, and um, we were rebelling against the fact that our taxes could only be paid first in gold and silver and then later in gold, and, and, and on the stamp tax. And because we didn't have that much gold, but the reason that we were being taxed in gold was because that was the coin of currency that the Bank of England was accepting. And people need to realize that the Bank of England is separate from the monarchy. It's privately owned. And that 70% of all of the taxes that they were collecting on the entire English Empire were going to fund the debt against the war. And the interest on that debt alone was costing them 75 or 70% approximately of their, of their money incoming. And the banks wanted to be paid in gold. So this obsession with gold starts in the ancient world and it, and it, and it, and it becomes, you know, um, the way to spur the common man on to create, you know, what I would call a false revolution, of course, because we ended up paying reparations to who? To King George. Well, I was going to show you the, the doors to the Philosophical Research Society, Manly P. Hall, 33rd degree. Uh, and it'll come up, but... Uh... There's one, okay, so... Oh, this is the ones that you have on your uh, your YouTube channel. Yeah, so... Well, so on one door, there's a reptilian with slit alien eyes, and he's being worshipped by what look to be Asians uh, below him, and he's holding the pine cone. So the reptilian-eyed being is holding the pine cone or the pineal gland, the, the passage to the other dimension. And then over here you have an amphibian man, and he's holding a staff that looks like a penis, or regeneration. So right there at the Masonic Philosophical Research Society by 33rd Degree Free Basin, Manly P. Hall, on his library doors is the Sirius Alpha Draconis story, uh, the, the reptile and the fish people. Same as in my picture, same as in David Icke. David Icke didn't get the amphibians into his story. That was my story to tell, you know, where he's reptiles, I'm merfolk. You know, you got my Columbia goddess, you know. Um, but there it is, and I'm not sure because the, the research society was closed when we went there as to when those doors were manufactured and when they put up these. And we, if you see it, I mean, the guy's eyes are slit. And there's uh, reptilian eyes on this guy. Uh, you know, the pyramids and your art and architecture, all of these things indicate their allegiance. <laughs> and it just had popped up and it made me think about 
how many more representations of this serious alpha draconis connections we have. Uh, there's quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, let's, 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 let's go back to the goal and start where we were before. <clears throat> okay, so uh, an interesting example of this obsession with gold from ancient civilization to today is the Incans, who, when taking over the pyramid lands in Central America and South America, uh, did not build them, right? They, they took over. Uh, the pyramids were already there. Interesting tales on how the Incas had managed to come and move to the most unhospitable lands where no food grows and decide to live there and build pyramids instead of a nice tropical region which would have just been the same amount of distance in the other direction. And instead, and they say that these people had no language or mathematics and yet all of these things are astronomically aligned and, and uh, you can't build a pyramid without some form of communication. It's just not going to happen. So, uh, when we get to the Incas, now at this point they had lost all knowledge of how to even mine gold. Yeah, this was go, uh, you know, the ancients would do that, and so at this point they're just panning gold out of the rivers, and they didn't know, but yet they knew of all the subterranean chambers that Eric von Daniken shows, all of the passages, thousands of miles that go under the entire continent in South America that you can travel even to an island, from under the ocean, through a tunnel, and all of these tunnels are perfectly smooth wall as if they had used some sort of laser drill to melt and smooth the walls as they went. So indescribable, inexplicable uh, things there. Cortez shows up. Now lo and behold, Cortez was sent, well, for one thing, to find the fountain of youth, right? So the elite have this idea of immortality that they're certain is possible and they're working towards it. But second, the gold. They will either go in after all the gold. Cortez shows up on the day that Quetzalcoatl is supposed to show up and arrive. And all of the Incans had depicted their gods on the wall, and they have beards. Yeah, and they're bearded white men. And so the Incans themselves grow no facial hair. None of the, the natives of that region grow facial hair, but yet their gods are depicted with it. And then here comes Cortez, lo and behold, and they say, Ah, oh, you know, Quetzalcoatl has shown up. Let's give them all the gold, right? Because that's what our job is on the planet. We mine gold for the gods to pass it on. And so if we were to take this to the modern age, uh, currently we have the International Space Station, or what I like to call the ISIS, right? the ISS. And this International Space Station is a compilation of all of these different nations. And when we look back to the ancient tales of the Agigi, as you had mentioned with Zechariah Sitchin, the Agigi were uh, a race that remained in orbit all the time, and what they would do is launch the gold to the Agigi that orbited planet Earth, and then when planet X came close enough, they would launch the gold from the, the Agigi up to the planet Nubiru, right? Well, now we're to the point where we have the Isis up there, and if you take this story into belief, then you realize that Japan is building a massive uh, platform on the on the International Space Station that they say are for experiments <laughs> and they won't tell us why there's so much effort putting into this giant platform then you take into account that all the gold is missing you know gold Fort Knox gone uh, the 30 million in gold under the Twin Towers well I'll tell you that entire story is actually a theme of Die Hard <laughs> uh, so if you watch Die Hard you'll see how the trucks which were Dick Cheney's came in to clean up the supposed terrorist attack, but actually it was all to steal the gold in the trucks that were cleaning up the, the rubbish, right? Well, that's what Dick Cheney did with his Halliburton trucks, and that's what they showed us in Die Hard before it ever happened. Yeah, and they've just caught them with um, fake gold again not that long ago in England as well, Bank of England. Uh, oh, yeah, tungsten. Tungsten yeah. bars. Yeah, yeah. And so what's going on, right? Are they, they actually now sending all of this gold up to the International Space Station to wait for the gods to return. Now as, as crazy as all of that sounds, we can look to the history and look to the stories. Not just the ancient mythologies that give us the ideas of this going on, but to what actually is going on. Like I said, the, the capping of the Great Pyramid with gold. Y2K, you know. 
this was a big year. This was a, a very esoteric uh, adventure. And what I believe it was, was that we were entering the Aeon of Horus, that Aleister Crowley had predicted the, the time of the crowned and conquering child. And that the Brotherhood wanted to celebrate the rising of this Aeon. And in doing uh, the Aeon shift, they also have to shift all of their sigils and, and lay points on the planet so that now we are watching the shift of the capitals and you'll see this in Astana, Canberra and, and uh, well in America would be moving to, to Denver and Atlanta probably but definitely Denver at this point uh, but when we saw the Y2K ritual now when I was talking to people about Y2K and let's just say that I'm, I was working at the university and I was just kind of slipping people this knowledge during lunch breaks. I'd give them documents on HARP and all of the crazy conspiracies that I was doing. And I would slip them the information where FEMA and the Department of Defense are asking Americans to prepare for three days of catastrophe in case of a computer meltdown on Y2K, right? And so they're like, oh man, oh, you can't believe what you read on the internet, you can't, and I'm like, it's .gov. Oh, no, 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 and everybody just really shook it off. Now, the truth be known, you couldn't get a power uh, generator in Y2K. If it were December and you wanted to get yourself a, a, you know, a power generator, uh, you couldn't get one. They, they were sold out, and so there were people that were taking this to heart. But your common college student and the people around were just like, oh, poppycock. And honestly, I wasn't too concerned about a Y2K meltdown, because I would have personally liked that. You know, imagine if all the banks just went down and nobody had any more credit problems, right? Oh, God forbid. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> so, I wasn't actually concerned about any sort of computer meltdown, but people treated me as if I was some nut for even bringing it up. And I'm going, but it's your government telling you, you know, shouldn't you at least consider that you know, the Federal Emergency Management Agency is telling you this, and I oh, don't know. So they expected me to be in a bunker, but I wasn't. I was actually recording my first film for, uh, uh, well, what became the Freeman Perspective, right? Because uh, I sat there and recorded the whole Y2K ritual. And this ritual was a massive celebration to Horus, beginning with the burning of the Acropolis in Greece and going to capping the Great Pyramid with gold, which didn't happen. Uh, and it, curious, the, the title, A Muslim Stopped the Freemasons from Capping the Great Pyramid of Gold. You're going to find this story playing out, the Muslim Freemason story throughout. But uh, then they burnt the River Thames, or had fireworks, speed, at the speed of the sun across the River Thames, symbolizing the river sticks to the underworld. And then they ignited all their Masonic phalluses, like the Alf Eiffel Tower and the Washington Monument. And then Bill Clinton comes out, and they make a light so bright behind the Lincoln Memorial that it looks like the sun is rising in the west, which is a code for Horus, the rising sun and the rising sun of the west. And at this moment, Bill Clinton's standing in front of the public giving his Y2K speech, just kind of opening it, and he says, it is a rising sun. It is a rising sun. And everybody goes, Yay! You know, they didn't know what to do. They didn't understand what he meant. And so I witnessed this entire celebration of Horus as a Y2K ritual from one side of the globe to the other and recorded and deciphered all of this. So this kind of opened me up to what was going on with the esoteric realms and how it coupled with what we called nationalism and even uh, religion and economics. Well, that correlates a lot to uh, the work that Jordan Maxwell um, was doing also with regard to the rising sun and, and the, the phrase dawn of a new day. Mm -hmm. Which is becoming, you know, is now the national de missile defensive logo and uh, Obama's logo. Obama's logo. I mean, you're, you're seeing it everywhere. It's in the, it's in the communist shield of arms. It's in right. a coat of arms. It's in... Uh, was Tool Society, if I may have Any number of Well, these. if I pulled down the Golden Dawn, uh, you would see uh, numerous... Uh, well, Golden Dawn itself indicates the exactly, rising sun, exactly, you know, I mean... Exactly. It couldn't Which, be more obvious than, than Golden Dawn there. Kind of flashes me back to one thing you had brought up before, was the friction match. And 
well, there's one film company called Phoenix Pictures, and they have a corporate logo that is a friction match, a Lucifer, striking across the ground and then becoming a sun rising and becoming a burning phoenix. Now, Lucifer or Phoenix Pictures actually produces films about cloning, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. Now, realize that, uh, understand the, the, the connection here is that Arnold Schwarzenegger was begging George Bush to release the restrictions on stem cell research so that he could open the door to human cloning. And George Bush responded by bringing the stem cell research leftovers? I, I don't know what to call them. The babies that they went ahead and produced uh, and made humans out of their technologies and brought all these kids that would have died if the stem cells would have not. It was very bizarre. So Arnold Schwarzenegger was, was very pro-human cloning, you know, and he's, he's a you know, Nazi and all that. And then he's in this film all about human cloning, The Sixth Day, and it's put out by Phoenix Pictures that has a Lucifer as their logo. And they put out Apt Pupil, written by Stephen King, which is Nazi worship. And then they put out, in compilation with Disney, uh, Holes, which is all about child work camps. And yeah, with Sigourney Weaver. And so, when you start to decipher these signs and symbols around you all the time, you can almost uh, tell what the movies are going to be about or where they're going to go with their concepts, like Lion's Gate. That's the Gate of Ishtar. And that now stands in Berlin, where Obama gave his big speech, right? With the, the throne of Zeus there, right? Once you understand their symbolism and understand what they're after, then pieces of the puzzle come together. So, I was going to lead you to my predictions. Yeah, that's, that's good. Let's, uh, let's, let's have a listen, you know, in, in addition to the 9-11 prediction. Uh... Yeah, and, and honestly, I hope uh, maybe while you're here in town, because it was in Lawrence, Kansas that I predicted 9-11. And honestly, I was waiting for it for three years, because during the Bill Clinton era, this bill that caused 9-11 was in uh, the House. Yeah. And this was the bill to bring about a Homeland Security Act. And I got aware of it because I, you know, I was an early conspiracy theorist. Realized that back then there weren't cell phones, right? Uh, there weren't uh, Google. There was no Google. There was no Google videos. You had AOL, was your one site that you could get in, into the internet with, and that's about it. Or else you had your share networks, peer to peer and whatnot, and an email. Uh, so how fast our world has changed, right? I mean, there were, there were no cell phones. Let's just keep it that way. Just think about that, all right? And yeah, here we are. And I'm, so I'm getting data. I'm getting information. I'm learning. And I'm finding out about this Homeland Security Act. And so I, everyone's reading it going, this is the most Nazi thing I've ever seen. Of course, we're not going to pass it. And so I kept waiting for them to bring about some sort of event to cause this to happen, of course, right? Uh, we needed to have a, a Reichstag burn, Exactly. And honestly, I knew nothing about false flag events. I didn't know about the Reichstag or anything like that. I just saw what they needed and where they were going. And I began to say, okay, somewhere in the middle of September, they're going to do a major terrorist attack to bring about this bill. Because the bill comes up every October 1st. And so I figured they'd need about two weeks public reaction time for people to, you know, pass this bill as if it were something new, right? And... But throughout the whole Bill Clinton era, every day, every mid of September, nothing happened. Now, I actually told my good friend and a bunch of people, well, the worshipful master of our lodge here in Lawrence, Kansas, knows that I predicted 9-11. And yet he went and joined the Masons and is now one of the lead. He just became the commander of the Knights Templar. Uh, but yet, he doesn't believe in a conspiracy. He doesn't believe in a thing that I have to say, even though I'm reading all of the Mason books and... I, I, every bit of data comes straight from them, or outside sources relating. And anyway, so I'm looking at this picture. I'm starting to come to a clear understanding of government me uh, mechanizations and manipulations of our reality. And then I watched them take Bill Clinton down. And when they brought Bill Clinton up before the public over um, extramarital affair mentioned insertions of a cigar into his secretary, Monica Lewinsky, and did all of this right in front of the American and world public while poor Bill's turning purple 
You know, he couldn't handle the embarrassment. He had pee break, excuse me, after, you know, I watched that whole painful thing. And I thought to myself, they don't do this to presidents. This is not common. This, you know, they cover this kind of stuff up. You can't have your leader appear weak. You can't do this. So it immediately to me registered as psychological warfare. It was an attack on us by bringing Bill Clinton down, this man of the people that plays saxophone with David Letterman, you know? And so it was that moment that clued me into the next 12 years. Uh, when I saw them taking Bill Clinton down, I said, okay, they're taking down the man. So the next thing they're going to do is take down the system. And in order to take down the system, they're going to have to force a president into office and make everybody angry about it. These were, this was exactly what I saw coming. And then I, they would follow that with an ineligible president. Right? So I said, okay. Well, then I started to hear the rumblings of this W. Right? And at that same moment, I'm starting to decipher and decode all the corporate logos around me. The, the sun sign of Target, the pentagram of Walmart, the, the golden arches, you know, you name it. There are all members and all signs of the inner rituals. And I'm deciding all of these and deciphering. Well, I got to Philip 66, and I was lost. Okay? I could outline, you know, I saw on Chevron, you had the double cube, which is the magician's altar, which stands in the Masonic Lodge. You had all of the, the different signs, symbols, the pentagram on Sitgo. But I get to Philip 66, and I say, well, okay. If every one of these, now, if you open Manly P. Hall's, or I'm sorry, Albert Pike, Grand Sovereign Commander of the Scottish Rite Freemasonry, I was given those books at the Temple of the 33rd um, when they looked up my grandfather's membership, and then she came back with them, and, and she slid them to me and said, well, these are 50 bucks a piece, don't tell anybody. And she gave me the books, and I, in the Albert Pike room, the author of the books. And so he's a lead magician. You read this book, you find out that he's heavily into Lifus Levi, who made that picture of Baphomet, the goat, everybody's so familiar with. That was a Lifus Levi's picture. That, uh, and that was a, uh, Albert Pike was a large follower of the Lifus Levi. And in the book, he, he mentions Sirius, he mentions all of the, the magical properties of sigils and symbols, and he discusses the fact that Freemasonry is Kabbalism, which is an ancient Hebrew form of mysticism that uh, supposedly pulls apart, uh, brings about superhumans, you know? Uh, this immortality and all the things they're seeing. And, and, and that particular, um, that particular uh, study, the, the Kabbalistic... Um and, and, and also the Talmud both come actually out of um, the Babylonian captivity. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's interesting to point out because these things all all trace back to Babylon which traces back to Sumer. And, and also the thing about uh, Kabbalah is that until you've studied the Bible on a literal level and you've studied on an interpretive level that you're not even permitted to begin to study the third level until you've reached your 50th year are male and have successfully jumped through all of the hoops to get to the first two levels of, of, of biblical study in, in the Hebrew tradition so you know uh, when you're looking at this of course right what do they have you do right, were the first three levels of masonry you know I and mean, that's people think that those are the only levels in, in a lot of cases um, but but again, you have to pass through your novice, you have to pass through your initiate until you get to your master phase. And in, in a lot of cases, um, you know, a lot of people weren't living to 50 back in the day. So That's you're talking true. about a very select group of, you know, people that, that were wealthy enough to get the type of nutrition that one needs in childhood to live a nice long life. Right. And, and these were the only people privy, you know, to this information. And you're still seeing you know, the, these levels of selectivity. I just wanted to point that out. Please do go on. No, yeah, no, it's absolutely true. Well, so then you, you take this in, and then you're, you're to Khazarian Jews and Ashkenazis and things like Jews that aren't Jews, or you realize that Madonna and Britney Spears, you know, are our current representations of Kabbalists, uh, and you go to the fact that all of your signs and symbols then have to be deciphered in Hebrew. And so when I got to Philip 66, the first thing I did was pull out my magician's dictionary and see what the number 66 stood for. Well, lo and behold, 66 is the number of the fallen angels. It's a force within the Kabbalah which is known as the Klipot. However you might want to pronounce that, Q-L-I-P-P-O-T-H. Uh, some people say Klipot. Uh, 
And this force is, is also known as excrement, or the souls of those that died insane. <laughs> so that is the meaning of the, the number, 66. And I thought, well, that, that's apropos, excrement, fallen angel, W, yeah, I get it. Well, the reason it equates to W is because in Hebrew, the, letters, or the number 6 is V. And so every letter is a number in Hebrew, and, and the letter V is 6. And so when you take 66... Uh, that would be the, that would be Vav, uh, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, Vav. Yes, Vav, yeah, yeah, exactly. And when you take, you take that number and you transliterate it into the letter, then you get Philip's W, right? Now, take this one step further and realize that Adolf Hitler was also a member of the occult order and uh, ran out Freemasonry because he didn't want any competing wizards, right? He ran out the Jews and the Gypsies to get rid of all competing wizards and adopted even the methodology of Freemasonry of having a knightly order. And, and most of uh, Freemasonry remained there, except for in open... Right, they, it remained in essence and not in... And this would, be, this would be the, the, a lot of the magic that was uh, derived from, from the, um, again, you know, the Templars, which everybody knows about, you know, going into Jerusalem, but the, the Teutonic Knights were there as well. So this is, this is you know, um, the, the magic that was, that was coming down through the Teutonic Knights, through the Tool Society, and then to, um, to, to Adolf Hitler. Who designed the car of the people. The Volkswagen, right? Yeah, yeah. This was Hitler's dream to bring about uh, you know, full community transportation, or that's what they tell us, like they tell us things about Walt Disney. Well, what did he put on that Volkswagen? But a V and a V, right? When you look at it, it's two Vs interlaced. So you've got your 66, your excrement fallen angel symbol, but he crossed them, making a third V, making 666 out of the Volkswagen logo. When you look at the Philips 66 logo, you'll see there's six points on the crest, making another coded 666 out of the 66, the fallen angels. So, all, all of a sudden, all these, these meanings and messages became very clear for me. And, and, the, and the fallen angels, you know, in, in, in the Bible would be what was referred to as, as the Nephilim, as opposed to the Rephium, which come from under the water. Exactly. You know how few people know about the Rephium. <laughs> Very few, none, yeah, and then they, they don't know what to think, though. I don't know, they're insane spirits under the water. Yeah, the horrible ones that come from below the ocean, I mean, it, it's the same thing as the, as the normal. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, um, John, Ones, Nomo, these are all the same thing, you know, mm -hmm. it's why, you know, John's the fisherman and... Right. Exactly, and then and that's that whole other story, the the John story, the Saint John, which I'm I'm not ready to take on yet, but uh, you know I've chased the Black Virgin, I've seen you know I I've read the tales, but I'm not ready to cover that one yet. Oh, no problem. You know, <laughs> but it, it, it's just you know to, to indicate that these things are all really interconnected, and yeah, the Ioannites, the Ovanes, uh, all of that, yeah, going right back to Nimrod. And, you know, and any time, and any time you get, you know, um, any sort of religious movement, it's 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 automatically co-opted by the um, by the by the brotherhood, if you like, uh, or you know, by the secret societies, and and you know, they're even not terribly particularly secret about you know their their co-opting of religions. You look at the Council of Nicaea, and they're like, oh yeah, we're just gonna throw away the Book of Enoch, and we're gonna throw away the Book of Noah, and we're gonna, right, you know, yeah. And so then, what we have now are people like Aleister Crowley or John Dee, the military industrial uh, intelligence agent working for Queen Elizabeth, uh, and channeling angels called Enochian magic. And Enoch is, is a major uh, player inside of the Masonic Lodge as well. And then, when you realize the further connection, if we could bring it up to our exopolitical world, the very angel or alien visiting Billy Meyer in Switzerland is now I'm Shemyaza and Shemyaza is the lead uh, fallen angel that teaches sorcery and warfare to mankind and she being a she now uh, in, in Switzerland with Billy Meyer this extraterrestrial known as a Plajaran uh, is aware of this and says well obviously I am not that Shemyaza I'm a woman right <laughs> 
<laughs> but yeah, here that's encoded in the Book of Enoch. That's the whole story, and this will even take you back to Alice Bailey and and more theosophical ideas of the hierarchical entities of aliens. And this story gets deep. It gets really deep, and you find that all of the esoteric arts are amount of channeling these consciousness or extra dimensional entities into people's beings that can then communicate. Sometimes through channeling, or sometimes full possession, or sometimes just by you know, subtle movements. But we, we have begun to understand that there's way more to the story of civilization on planet Earth than what we think. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, when they, when they start to, to pull this, you know, shit about, um, and that's really what it is, folks, is shit. When they start to pull this shit about, we're, you know, the pinnacle of human civilization, and... Well, in that case, how the fuck did they mine the stones for Baalbek? Just take exactly. Baalbek alone. Baalbek I mean, alone. That is such That's it. a flippin' mind bender. You know, I mean, you know, given enough time, certainly not in the time period that it was created by the Egyptians, but given enough, given enough time, we would eventually be able to build a pyramid like that. We cannot even cut the stones for Baalbek. Exactly. You know, yeah. I, much less transport one, much less get it. 16 feet up in a wall like that, I mean, you know, when you, when you see the evidence for this, when you see the evidence of, 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 the, of the sheet of glass, you know, that's, that's, um, that's under the desert, you know, in the Middle East, and, uh, you know, it predates, it predates any atomic explosion, and nobody could figure out where this giant freaking sheet of glass came from, and then the first atomic bomb goes off, and, wow, suddenly we know where that sheet of glass came from, you know, it, 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 it so indicates that we're being lied to. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's so funny because you see modern archaeologists, you know, who've, who've been given a, a mainstream education, and it's like, they just put blinkers on it. It's like, oh, well, we, don't, we don't take into account that, that the Antikytheria device, and, and we don't take into account those balls that they found in a freaking coal mine in Africa that are so perfectly balanced that NASA can't make one that's better balanced, you know? And these things have got perfectly symmetrical grooves around them you know, that are absolutely perfectly placed so that they don't interfere with the balance of it. And, you know, we're trying to figure out where the hell these things, how they ended up in a, in a coal bed, you know, thousands of feet down. And, 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 and yet the archaeologists are going, well, we don't take that into account because it messes up our whole theory. Well, you know, it, it, it's like, you know, it's like them working on, on the expansion of the universe without taking into account the part that contracts. Right. Well, I, if I could jump in ar archaeology real quick. Uh, I did go to Kansas University for ancient architecture, and so they, they taught me these very things in ancient architectural school. You know, in the university, they'll tell you that the pyramid datings is false, and it was Colonel Weiss, who was a Freemason, trying to make a name for himself. They'll tell you that we can't move the stones for Baalbek, Lebanon. They showed me all of this in architectural school, but yet yeah, it's not in the public eye. And you still see all of the dating to 3500 BC to Khufu for the pyramids when they know that's a fraud. It was an absolute fraud. And yet they continue to perpetrate that myth. But we'll realize this at this very moment, okay? Uh, it's what, October 26th or something like that? On October 10th, Zahi Hawass, the uh, Grand General Secretary of the Giza Plateau, also known as the uh, head of Egyptian culture, is the one standing in between everyone in these revelations. So all of these now, I did witness and have in my film Zahi Hawass announcing finding the tomb of Osiris. With Maury Povich. Oh, God, it's so funny. It's so funny. <laughs> Poor Maury. And he announces this, that it's deep down in the earth we found this, this shaft that is the tomb of Osiris, straight from Zahi's own mouth, right? This is the tomb of Osiris. And he says, you see behind me are all of these tunnels, and we do not know where they go. So the, the subterranean plaza all under the Giza Plateau, he's announcing this with Maury Povich, who did not return to the crypt, by the way. It was... Oh, my Anyway, uh, so Zahi Hawass then um, is this man that stands in, in the middle saying that, no, the pyramids were built by, by levers and, and rope and, and discounts any ideas of ancient civilizations or ancient gods or E.T. Yet, just two weeks ago, he was at 
the Association for Research and, en and Enlightenment, the uh, group founded and started by Edgar Casey followers, in a massive conference about Atlantis. Now, it was actually the ARE that funded Zahi Hawass's Egyptol Egyptological studies. Uh, it was the ARE that paid his University of Pennsylvania schooling to, to become the lead Egyptologist. And, and should we also point out, University of Pennsylvania is one of two places that teaches uh, Kineaform, one of two places that, that is a university for English-speaking students, I should, I should point this out, that you can go to Oxford or you can go to University of Pennsylvania if you want to learn Kineaform and you're an English speaker. That's it. Right. So, and, 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 the, and the prerequisite for uh, learning at Oxford is um, fluent German and French because a lot of the texts are still in German and French. Right. So, I mean, these languages, the, the Hebrew, the Kineaform, these, these languages themselves are a closely guarded secret in a way because there's so few places where you can go to learn this information and then often when you go to learn it you're 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 learning you know something that's that's been tweaked to a slight untruth slightly tweaked yes yeah uh, and, and there's no doubts about what Zechariah Sitchin shows you what you can see that the cuneiform structure looks like a rocket departing and you know uh, the, the very language and everything looks like it I've been to the Georgia Guidestones where they have all the different languages. Uh, uh, it was interesting that they chose like Swahili. I, I thought that rare. Um, but they also have cuneiform and, and Egypt uh, hieroglyphs. And, but you can see that in language, language is frequency. And you can see that the Chinese only takes up about two thirds of the block, whereas the English takes up the whole block. You know, and you can get your concepts and you start to see how the word masters, the ones that have designed our very language, are the ones that are creating our reality. And simple things like when, well, I believe Sir Francis Bacon, in the writing of the King James Bible, uh, changed very simply the word from congregation to church. The word from, um, you know, the word from young maid to virgin. Ah, yeah, young girl, you know, I mean, the well, yeah, difference between a young girl and a virgin. Exactly, or a congregation putting all the emphasis on the people gathering as opposed to the word church. Or, or, even, just, or even just the removal of the pluralizations. Elohim right. is plural. Sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you see this, and I was discussing with um, Ben Stork the other day, um, the fact that Hebrew and um, Assyrian and some of the older Semitic languages some of the first languages are cymatic languages. Right. So that the sounds in the language create particular cymatic vibrations and that English is, is actually atonal and it's, it's actually a, a, cymatic, a cymatic deconstructive language as opposed to a cymatically constructive right. language. Right, exactly. Our, our, our language is you know, 180 degrees from the true di divine language that we could be uttering. You know, and, and, and when you when you look at how cymatics work, you can understand why why, you know, the Bible talks about the word mm -hmm. of God. Yeah, exactly. And then you know? the logos, yeah. And uh, and and of course, you know, when one changes the word of God, one changes the meaning as well. And it changes not just that, but it changes the physical structure. Right. And, and, and take a word like absolute and we look at that and we think of absolute, which means the all-encompassing, right? But then you break it down and you realize that what you have is Ab, Father in Hebrew, Sol, which is Son, and Uta, which is the Sumerian form of Horus, or uh, uh, Tammuz. So Uta was the original form, U-U-T-E. So absolute is that uh, Father, Son, s uh, Child. And this is mathematically explained through the 47th proposition of Euclid, which then is your Masonic code if you wear the, the, the sign of the cubes. You know, you have a square with the, the right angled and another one. And this symbolizes Isis, Horus, and, or Isis Osiris, and Horus. Well, it's, it's amazing, you know, how much of this, this information that, that was available has been pulled out of circulation. This is why the dictionary is no longer this big, right? <laughs> like, yeah. you control the words, you control the concepts, you control right. what people can think, 
Orwellian Newspeak. And you can introduce this Orwellian Newspeak. Webster was a leading Freemason that wanted to even encode the ideas that the Bible used in using number codes and using uh, word codes that would lead you from one thing to another. And people don't realize that, that when, this, when this was put together, people like Tolkien were involved in sure. the writing of the definitions right. for what the words mean. You know, Tolkien, who wrote The Lord of the Rings, yes. Saturn, El, Bilal, Bell. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you, this, is, this is all about, you know, a deity. And, uh, and and the Lord of the Rings was not a benevolent deity in his book, was it? No, it was <laughs> not, not. Not at and all. It, you know, and we can take it to the Sauron, and you're back to the reptiles of Sirius, or Alba Draconis again. This whole alien story that we're dealing with now, that's kind of bubbling up through the Fadian Society, and through the Royal Society, which is the Rosicrucians, and... Uh, you tie this all together, of course Fabian's logo is the sheep in wolf's clothing, and, or wolf in sheep's clothing, you know, let's get that right. And you start to see this picture start to bubble to the surface, which is where we're at now, and I would love to, to get to that. Uh, yeah, well, okay, so what happened to me was I started wandering the earth around, and I ended up in Austin, Texas. I'm sitting... I won't give you the whole story of how I got on TV. It's an interesting one. It involves extraterrestrials, aliens, and Shimaza. Do you want to hear it? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go <laughs> right, I'll ahead. give you the shortened version. I go down to, to Austin, Texas just to hang out for a weekend. And I meet this homeless guy. And we, we discuss the, the Keys of Enoch, which is a very strange and also ties up in this with J.J. Hurtak. He's a homeless guy on the bus, and he starts doing my numerology, and he keeps screaming to me, You're the goddess. You're the goddess. And it was really crazy because at that moment I was just getting to the goddess as my life had worked through its uh, tarot connections. I went from the fool and then I ended up at the magician's dictionary, got to the magician, and then I was on the high priestess and getting to Austin and seeing all the Columbia depictions in Austin, I could decode the goddess finally. I saw the pentagram in the shell with her and all of the symbols and signs around her and started to understand. And meanwhile, this homeless guy on the bus doing my numerology is going, you're, you're the... You're, you're the goddess. He's Zoe, isn't he? I want to keep Zoe immortalized. I want to give the Zoe Award for anyone that does this for somebody. But what Zoe did was he left a message on my van that I was sleeping in as I was traveling around. And it says, you got to go to this meeting in the mall. All right, so I go to the meeting in the mall, and I have no idea what's going on. It's kind of a rundown mall. I get there, and it's George Green, who is uh, ex-secret ruler of the world that turned down his pirate and uh, deep underground military base to go meet the Plagiarans that were visiting Billy Meyer, uh, these extraterrestrial humans that were flying their spacecraft. If you've ever seen uh, Fox Mulder's poster, I want to believe, that is a Billy Meyer photograph, because uh, they're hanging out with him and flying their flying saucers. So here's George Green showing us all the pictures of the flying saucers, and the, the Plagiarans themselves, like Shomyaza, and they all have kind of crazy wild hair like me, and I'm the only crazy one in the well, looking one in the audience, <laughs> and uh, he keeps looking at me, the George Green, and he says, sometimes the Palladians will come into my lectures and uh, you know, listen to what I'm up to, and he's looking right at me. And I was just, I thought, hmm, I'm going to play this off, because I always thought I was an alien, and I always thought I was from Palladians. As a little child, I'd look to those seven sisters and think, ah, oh, that's home. And so this has always been something of mine. So during a cigarette break, I went out with everyone, and uh, I started pretending to be a Palladian. And I didn't let them know, I just subtly did things like call them Earthlings, or, you know, you people, your people, or, you know, the inhabitants of Earth, and things like that. I would, you know, just make little errors. In my hand. And I started to tell them what I understood of planet Earth. And now, at this point, I had already predicted 9-11, I had predicted W would be forced into office, and I was telling them all about the shock and all, Shekinah connections, and even the, the capping of the Great Pyramid of Gold. And they're all looking at me like, man, you're insane. Whoa, what, are you an alien? You know, because they've just gotten the reality dose of aliens in there. and They didn't know. And one big, tall, blonde man walks up to me and says, you need a TV show. And I was like, I, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's like, absolutely, would you do it? And I was like, well, if, uh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. You know, and I'm a man of my word, so I wanted to make sure that if I was telling this man, yeah, I'd do it, I'd do it. And I really searched my soul for about five seconds, you know, however long, and uh, said, yeah, all right, I'll do it. 
And he said, all right, great. And he wrote me a check. And he says, you take this check down to the, the Access Studios and you'll have a TV show. I'm like, no way. So I take that check, I go down there, I sign up for TV. Next thing I know, five years of my life is taken over by the Freeman perspective. So that was the first thing, is the television show. And if you ever want to get deep into my stuff, you got to start there. you got to go to Freeman's TV show on freemantv.com and just watch the TV shows in order. I placed them up there as I like them to be viewed. Interviews with uh, Twin Tower Architect, all of my documentaries, everything that I've done is there. And so the Freeman perspective became this global phenomenon. <laughs> you know? I didn't even know. I, you know. Like I say, Google was just coming to things and people, my roommates started uploading my, my shows to Google. And I didn't even know this was going on. And all of a sudden I'm getting famous around the world and I never even knew it. And <clears throat> so this led me then to give, be given a TV show or a, a radio show, which then became Radio Freeman. And then now I'm on to the free zone which I do every Saturday night live and you know, set up here with all my equipment and uh, just broadcast out to the world and it's it's an interesting thing to do because you're just a guy sitting in your room talking you know you know there's no one to interact with and you don't know who's listening but it turns out there's a lot of people out there listening to me and so now I am doing the free zone but I'm about to start a whole new project I'm re reviving Radio Freeman and it's going to be on four hours a week on uh, American Freedom Radio and then we have been invited to take over as hosts of the Matrix News Network and they have no idea what they've gotten themselves into <laughs> uh, Jamie and I will be doing the Matrix News Network on television on 150 stations around the US uh, yeah fantastic it's be huge. fantastic so excited. But of course, uh, this is all, um, oh, well, how do the lawyers say that they do it for free? <laughs> Pro bono. Pro bono. Absolutely. As, as, a, as, a, as, a, as opposed to, um, uh, what is it? Um, Getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, I gave up on the world. I said, I, I saw my miraculous existence as we discussed in the beginning. I saw that the world works in this miraculous way that guides us forth into a divine perspective that we can then just follow this force. And by Y2K, by that moment, I decided I could not, no longer participate in the real world. The real world was no longer real. Our leaders were worshipping 40 foot stone owls, burning baby effigies, capping the Great Pyramid with gold and trying to punch holes in the other dimension. Uh, forget your real world, you know? No, none, of, none of which seems terribly responsible. No, this <laughs> is true too, but how can you just go back to work and go back to doing whatever, working for Pizza Hut, and, and when you know that all of this is real? When you know that the world is more magical than anyone thinks, and it's a lot stranger than anyone has any idea about, and the things that they have us building, our new world, is not what humans need or want and it's got an alternate agenda and that's what I'm digging out and showing to everyone. Well I mean basically um, wasn't it John Dee's uh, supposition that that they were attempting to strip mine the planet because they need all of the energy to break free of the prison that this is. You know there's certain entities imprisoned here. This is just one of the, the theories. I believe it was John Dee who was the first one talking about that you know back under Queen Victoria. Right. Right. You know, and, and then, you know, at that time they were seen as, you know, uh, entities, the old gods, uh, the horrible ones, whatever you want to call them, you know, demonic entities. Um, but what we might call, you know, maybe extraterrestrial, or not even extraterrestrial, but extra-dimensional entities. Right, which is the new extraterrestrial. Since we've got this uh, new exopolitical study and understanding, we've had to change the terms. Because terms are, you know, everything. And so extraterrestrial now includes and means extra-dimensional beings, whereas alien is the new term for uh, an EBE, or a biological yeah, being. Yeah. So just now we're trying to get that terminology straight, because we've got this understanding that there's more than just beings coming here from another planet, there are beings that are in their acting from another dimension. Well, long long beho before I'd ever heard of David Icke or, or any of this sort of um, extraterrestrial <coughs> stuff, I had been saying just based on, you know, the mathematics for string theory and, and this kind of stuff, that the amount of power one would need, um, you know, based on a physical universe to travel 
uh, from one planet to another is prohibitive unless one goes extra dimensionally. Exactly. And so it, it's just funny to see, you know, which is what terminology going, take yeah. off like that. Right, right. And which is what's going on with the Rick experiments and the Phoenix and Star colliding their gold particles. Oh yeah, I mean, there's there's, there's no way that they're that they're doing what they say they're doing in in places like CERN. <laughs> no. You know, I mean. Uh, you yeah. know, they, no, they, 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 they risk of creating a ripple effect through, through the entire fractal that, you know, has, has a potential to, to sort of shatter life as we know it, yeah. to say the least. Yeah, and without any regard, yeah, they, they don't care about us. You know, Michael Jackson said it the best, right? Now, speaking of Michael Jackson, <laughs> have you seen uh, my picture of Michael Jackson? No, I didn't. I did not see the Michael Jackson one. I, I watched a. I watched a bit of stuff on Akhenaten, and I've seen a number of the interviews that you've done uh, over the years. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, well, I'm going over to Hollywood Mind Control on Freeman TV, um, and in here I have the the whole story of Anna Nicole, Brittany, and Mind Control. Now that's one that I'm not ready to cover or get into. You can see the symbolism of the '66. Uh, and I explain all of the meanings of Village Roadshow Productions and what all this, uh, but now, when you ask Jermaine or LaToya who killed Michael Jackson, they said it was the Illuminati. They, they, that was when the press came to, to LaToya and Jermaine, they were like, well, who killed Michael Jackson? And they're like, the Illuminati killed him. Uh, we have certain high-profile rituals that go on, like Justin Timberlake with, uh, with Janet Jackson, and she bared her breast with a golden sundial on her nipple. And so this is the sign of the god and goddess, the hermaphrodite. The goddess always has her breast bared, and then the golden sun is the male. So they put the hermaphroditic symbols together and performed it in a ritual at, a, at the Super Bowl and acted like it was a wardrobe malfunction. It was all a big deal, right? But these sort of high-profile rituals that they perform, such as the one with Madonna and Britney kissing, now realize that Justin Timberlake, Madonna, Christina Aguilera, Lindsay Lohan, Michael Jackson, Madonna, they all have connections to Disney, most of them being Mouseketeers. Mm -hmm. And as you saw, I've got the official Mouseketeer documents, which kind of frightened me. But Michael Jackson was a slightly different case, Anna Nicole and another. Uh, but Michael Jackson, he, he kind of seemed to get charge of things and get in control of things as if they didn't have full control over him. and. Just before he was, well, it was it was a little while before he died, but back back around the time when he was hanging his baby over the balcony, mm -hmm. he was shopping as well, and I think it was Harrods. I'm not sure, but he was just spending millions upon millions of dollars. The guy's like, "How much money do you have?" And he's like, "Oh, I don't know, I'm a billion. And he's going around buying things for his new home, and they're not saying what where this home is or where it is. And what does he buy? But a golden replica sarcophagus of King Tut. Alright? He buys a life-size golden sarcophagus, a replica of King Tut's sarcophagus, and he's like, well, what are you buying that for? Are you, you going to be buried in that thing? And Michael says, no, I'm going to live forever. And the guy's like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, a month after Michael Jackson supposedly died, this bust was noticed in the Chicago Museum. No one had ever noticed this bust before. Until a month after Michael Jackson's death, and lo and behold, it is Michael Jackson appearing exactly as he appeared when he died. Yeah, when they, uh, you know, he was, he was, he was basically sculpted. This image, this, this bust was from the, uh, the period of Akhenaten. Yeah, no, but what I'm saying is that, is that right. he was intentionally sculpted to... No, no, no one had ever seen this thing before. No one had ever seen it, but no it was like, it was not... It. No one had noticed it. Right. It was sitting there the whole time. Maybe. Or, Michael Jackson time-traveled back to Akhenaten's period, and now it came into our new timeline and everybody saw it. Oh, that's interesting thought. Yes. Because Michael Jackson went to a roboticist and attempted to get mind transfer technology into a robot. You can see this in the movie Home Movie, and I, I have the interview on my radio show. Michael Jackson was into mind transfer technology, hoping to either transfer himself into a clone or a robot. 
and live forever. Hence his statement when asked if he was going to be buried in King Tut's sarcophagus. No, I'm going to live forever. Well, we're at this moment right now where we have mind transfer technology capabilities. Guess what computer is capable of this? The CERN LHC grid. It's the first computer capable of, of pushing exabytes of information. And this is the only size of com transmission information that can clone a human brain. It, it would also have to be a, a quantum-based computer in order to do this. It is a super cloud or a super grid that is formed of 200,000 interlock computers all in 33 nations, all with direct fiber optic lines. And it is the first computer that's capable. And of course, CERN was the one who created the World Wide Web in the first place. Yeah. Now the grid is... is Beyond that, right? This is direct fiber optic lines that are all connect, linked, and and our, our information system. So what we have right now going on around the planet is we have the Jesuit priests with CERN talking about aliens and trying to punch a hole into the other dimension, right? Where the CERN scientists said themselves something may come through. Their corporate logo is six 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 with a hyperdimensional portal. Meanwhile. We're putting up ionospheric heaters such as ISCAT, HARP, and SURA all around the globe, right? And these are massive radio frequency transmission devices that are capable of manipulating the weather, causing earthquakes, changing migration patterns, and messing with your head. And but on generally top of fucking that, up our poor cetaceans. But on top of that, they can also transmit Dorito commercials to Ursa Major, as they did with the ISCAT in Norway. It was a big promotion that they had. And they sent a Doritos commercial to Ursa Major. So now if you couple this, all this technology, uh, NASA is putting up a new deep wave space guide antenna in Australia next to where they already have the Boeing VLF array which caused a big droid eye to open up in the satellite relays, satellite imagery. You can see all this in my Space War News. Uh, we now have the technology to take somebody's brain and transmit it to another star, to another system. They transmitted, they simulcast the day the Earth stood still. When it was out in theaters, they were simulcasting it to Alpha Centauri. Now that movie says, Earthlings are so screwed up, we'll never fix ourselves, just kill us. You know, unless you know Klaatu, Varata, and Niku, right? But, uh, they want to simulcast this movie to the closest known inhabited civilization in, the, in our galaxy, uh, while showing it to us on the films and... Man, once you get into Hollywood, it just gets scary. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, Hollywood, you're looking at, at uh, a situation where anybody that I've, I've, I've dealt with that's, that's um, dealt with Hollywood, Jordan Maxwell, and there's um, you know, a ballet dancer who's a good friend of a, a director that I know who's you know, corroborating all of this. And it's just it's, it's completely up to its eyeballs and Satanism. Uh, and if you're not if you're not involved in uh, in one of these secret groups that you're you're just not going anywhere. Well there's, there's no doubts. This website's the most of I wanted to show you this because this this ties right into that uh, ancient technology of the future. In 1996, they came out with SG-1, the idea of transmitting souls through a stargate and they become, you know, and end up on another star system. 1996, this came out, and when you see in the credits, it says, We greatly acknowledge the cooperation of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, and United States Space Command, or the U.S. Space Force, in the creation of SG-1, right? Now, there's so much reality in SG-1, right? A lot of things, and, and a lot of, yeah, a lot of fluff to keep you not believing in anything. But one thing you'll notice is that the SG-1 characters are identical to the Obama administration. They're identical. Look, I yeah, mean, yeah. you can see that each character was portrayed before they came into our uh, attention. Yeah, yeah. And Akhenaten, or Obama, becomes then the character Apophis. Now what are the odds that the moment Obama comes into office they declare that he has to save the world from Apophis, an incoming asteroid that's about to destroy planet Earth in 2029 or 2036 or not at all. They're not sure. But they're using this asteroid to 
foment the weaponization of space. Well, I'm sure you've seen the, the footage of, um, of the huge flipping, I don't know whether there's an asteroid or a comet, that got shoved off our path by a, a, a bit of sun. Uh, the sun had a, yeah, I don't know yeah. the exact specific term for it was, but it had a sort of a solar flare. And it just hits this, uh, this, this giant asteroid and or comet and shoves it right out of our orbital path. So, you know, I mean, uh, that's the exact thing. Yeah, you can see that. And this is straight from the Soho satellite. Yeah. And this was actually back in 99, uh, when I was watching very closely in Sun Cycle 23. Now we're up to 24 and we're seeing all kinds of strange stuff. Right now, at this moment, a giant ring is forming around the Sun, a coronal mass ejection that we've never seen. It's formed an entire ring around the Sun, and if this thing goes off, we're done. I mean, it's over. Yeah, I know that this, this is... Um one of the things that you know a number of people have been have been talking about and you know this is now this the is reason for supposedly the reason for some of the um, the high atmosphere chemtrailing not so much the low atmosphere stuff but well that brings you to the norway spiral <laughs> yeah which is which is an amazing in, in and of itself it was sort of a heart facility there yeah i'm the one person that can explain to you what occurred why i don't know uh, well I, I would like to know yeah i would okay, very much well, like to know Right here is, and we'll, we'll get you images of this, this is the, the VLF array in, in Australia. And as I was starting to talk about it being used in Australia and, and the fact that they can transmit to other solar systems, this big droid eye showed up in the rat satellite relay. And it happens to correlate exactly to the location of the VLF array in, in Australia. Mm -hmm. And so then we've had some anomalous earthquakes and things of that nature while that was going on. Uh, one of them actually occurred right when the BP oil explosion happened. The Norway spiral, and you can see this in my uh, film, Obama Alien Invasion, which is one of my YouTubes. I had an insider bit of source on this whole thing. Uh, I had received word from Rosalind Peterson at California Skywatch, who is a, a major opponent to chemtrailing. Uh, you might have probably seen her posters all around that say, up in the sky, look up in the sky, and they show all the different variations of chemtrails. Well, she, got, she gets reports and keeps up to date, and she passed on to me that they were going to launch the Cloud of Care from Wallops Flight Facility, which is also known as Mars. And this is the launch facility in Virginia. And so I find out about the CARE. This is the Charged Aerosol Release Experiment. And I watch it launch. Well, lo and behold, the news says, wow, something opened in the sky. It looked like a big blue beam came out of a hole in the sky and then sucked itself back up. And we think it's aliens. And that's what the news said. Meanwhile, I'm covering the launch live on my radio show saying, you know, here goes the charged aerosol release experiment. You can watch it live on NASA TV. The news is saying, oh, well, you, we have no idea what happened. And I cover the whole thing. It's an aluminum oxide cloud that was deployed at 173 miles up into the atmosphere, which is just the exact height of the, the International Space Station, which is about 183 miles up. And they launched this aluminum oxide cloud up in the ionosphere, announced it to the public, but no one was paying attention, and said they were testing noctilucent clouds. Well, after this happens and all the alien stuff the news put out about it, then next thing you know, Barack Obama's going to get his Nobel Peace Prize. And just in the morning before his Nobel arrival, this opens up in the sky. And it, it's clearly a rocket that has been launched and is, is uh, spiraling what I say uh, a controlled out of control. It's spewing aluminum oxide out of the side of the fuselage to make the rocket spiral. And then that spiral is then pulsed by the ISCAT or the Solvabard antenna array uh, from the ground. And so what you see with the blue spiral, that is aluminum oxide, which is the base element of sapphire. And that's why it's blue. And that's why the people who described the cloud of care also saw a blue spiral coming out of it, but it wasn't in the video. So what we have is some new technology that I think might even be based on like the Bell experiments of the Nazis of having uh, switching rotations of spiraling mercury to cause 
spatial dimension gaps in time. And I think that they're trying to do it now out in the open using these pulsed antenna arrays that are, you know, tuned to whatever frequency along with the aluminum oxide. And uh, I, what it's for, I don't know. You know. I don't know. But here, it's funny, when this occurred, people were going, oh, it was just a rocket. And so then you're going, okay, so you're saying the Russians just launched an ICBM over the president on his way to get a Nobel Peace Prize? Is that what we're saying is happening here? Which one's worse, right? <laughs> are are the, the Russians are launching an ICBM, a nuclear-capable rocket, over the president, or a Norway spiral is, is opening? A lot of people try to take that to ET connections. I disagree wholeheartedly with any extraterrestrial connection because you can watch the cloud of care. And not only that, you can watch the same thing being formed in China, another one the next day in Russia, same thing, uh, one over America, one over California. I've got them all listed here, and you can just follow them along, that these are new experiments going on, like here's the one in Russia that happened right afterwards. And, um, not to mention that around that same time you had the giant pyramid over Moscow. It was the same day, yeah, that evening, uh, the giant pyramid floating over Moscow, yeah, which is also in the article. Uh, that was a very strange day, for sure. I mean, <laughs> the absurdity of the president getting a Nobel Peace Prize for extraordinary efforts was absurd enough, but to have giant portals opening in the sky. And, uh... But yeah, uh, aluminum oxide cloud, charged aerosol release experiment, are your clues to that. Um, so we're looking at this new warfare coming down the pike, and so what they had done is start to organize the American people through the bring down of the man, Bill Clinton, the railroading of the evil emperor, the W, the excrement, right? And so when I when I had made that prediction, I said, okay, they're going to force the next president. Uh, w is going to be the last American president, I would say. And I said they're going to force W in, and he'll be the last American president. When they forced the W in, I knew that was the year, and I said, okay, this is going to be the year they they pull off that false flag event. And so I told everyone around here, you know, hey, there's going to be a major terrorist attack on 9-11. Don't freak out. It's for your own reaction. They want you to react. And I can pull you out Kenneth Grant's book uh, about Aleister Crowley right there that we got from uh, Treadwells in London, uh, right above it. Uh, Kenneth Grant, uh, a follower of, uh, yeah, of Aleister Crowley. And I can show you Aleister Crowley's tarot cards. I can bring out Isaac Bonowitz, the, the now past uh, Arch Druid, and they will all, and, and even Rex Church. They will all tell you that 9 and 11, 9 11 combined, is the satanic Luciferic number. Uh, it is the number of the sorcerer or sorcery. That 9 to 11 skips 10, which is God. So you're a self serving magician instead of a magi, you're a sorcerer. And so that's what the meaning of 9-11 was. And I, I started to decipher this when I realized that uh, Aleister Crowley had incorporated 9-11 into his tarot cards using the letter Teth, which is 9, which is snake. And we're back to the serpent in 9-11 again. So I had made this prediction and told everyone, hey, there's going to be a major terrorist attack on 9-11. Don't freak out. This is for your reaction, and, because that's what they want. They want you to be mad, angry, they're going to use this 9-11 truth movement against you in the end, in the American Nuremberg trials, which are yet to come over this coming space war. I had a line of people at my door going, how the heck did you know? How did you know? And what was really bizarre is that at least three people in that line already had their 20s folded as the Twin Towers burning. You seen that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm sitting there going, now, I understand how I made my, you know, my guess, my hypothesis, but how did you know about this folded 20? That's ridiculous. And they said, oh, it's all over the internet. And once again, that was only AOL, the eye in the pyramid, right, that you could get that information from. And so they were promoting, self-promoting their own ritual to us already. They need us to know that they did it. They need us to know that they're going to do it. So they put it in the lone gunman before it happened, right? Yeah. Uh, Chris Carter's production company's 1013, which is the next prediction I made. Uh, after 9-11, I had not been able to prove myself, right? Because that was just me here in town telling people, hey, there's going to be a major terrorist attack. So I wanted to prove my hypothesis on a more grand scale. So I came up with my next hypothesis, and that was the banking crash of 1013. And so I started doing 1013 reports. I have now five, five annual 1013 reports, all of them very intriguing. One with Rex Diabolus Church in Portland, 
uh, was uh, another, I, <clears throat> I managed to get on Alex Jones. And Alex, you know, he, he told me, well, you know, don't, don't go talking about yourself being the North American intergalactic rainbow ambassador to the Mayans. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 you know, don't, don't, don't talk about aliens and UFOs and uh, don't make any, any rigid, strict predictions or dates or anything like that. And so I, you know, you could go watch it. I did each of those things. I'm like, well, yeah, Alex, you know I'm the North American Intergalactic Rainbow Ambassador to the Mayans. Because that's what they, they asked me to be. They asked me to come and tell the world that the world's going to crumble and, and, you know, they need help to get into their subterranean chambers. Um, but I wanted to make that prediction. I wanted to make one where... I did it live because I didn't do it with 9-11. So I went on Alex Jones and I said, well, look, the next 9-11 is going to be 10-13. And I had a number of reasons of why, because I watched symbolic gestures. And 10-13, of course, is the date of the, the Papal Bull that brought down the Knights Templar. It was Friday the 13th, 1307, 10-13, October 13th. And so this also started being highlighted when W met with the Pope and they met in St. John's Tower. And this was the patron saint of, of the Knights Templar. And when they met with uh, W, when he met W and, and then gave a speech at uh, Ground Zero, uh, it was on Friday the 13th. And they kept making all these little subtle, suggestive, symbolic gestures. And so I, I realized and cited on 1013 as the next major event, and I, I announced it on Alex Jones, and no one noticed. <laughs> the headline, the headline for USA Today, uh, or not USA Today, but in Austin, Texas, I should just leave the website alone. The headline in, in Austin, Texas was 1013 bigger than 9-11. I, I have the headline on my website, right? <laughs> and I said, I told you. I told you, and then the whole coding of the Templar being our fiat currency, the taking down of the fiat currency on the 1013 date. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, I did it, and no one noticed. So that was my other one. But then the final one was to say that Bush would be the last American president, predicting the birther movement, because I knew they would need a birther movement, an ineligible president, to bring down the Constitution, which was the final step. So if they could get everybody behind this ineligible president and then say, oh my God, he's ineligible, then they would open the Constitution for revision, and that opens it for all revision. And that's what they've been trying to get is this CONCON, or Constitutional Convention. And uh, uh, so I predicted the birther movement, and that you can still see on my website you know, before it ever happened. So those were, uh, that's, that's my synopsis on how I see things and how I predict things through their symbolic gestures. Uh, you know, when they announced that there was piracy in Yemen, they used the Sirius star, and I said, oh, well, you know, next thing you know, Japan, NATO, America, Germany, everybody's going to Yemen. And then they announced that they found the Ark of the Covenant there. Yeah, or at least evidence to suggest that it was there and magnetic anomalies under the ocean and things. So they, they put these codes out, like the Shachanah is a coded of the Hebrew goddess Shekinah. And the Shachanah comes down and strikes Nebuchadnezzar, or Saddam Hussein, and Saddam Hussein's claiming to be Nebuchadnezzar reincarnated, and they use the mother of all bombs, which is the Moab, which are the people that Nebuchadnezzar was fighting. So the Shachanah, the Shekinah, comes down and strikes Nebuchadnezzar using the Moabs. It's the same story in the Bible, you know? Yeah, yeah. well, that, that's it. They're building up towards their Armageddon so that, you know, so that they can pretend to be the, uh, the deity that will save us all. Exactly. And that's where we're at right now. So they're flipping the script. You ETs have all become real. The space war is going full-fledged. We just launched the mini space shuttle, secret space shuttle, the X-37B. They tried to launch on the same day the hypersonic technology vehicle, and one out of Florida and one out of California both launched secret space programs. We just launched the space-based surveillance space system, uh, space-based space surveillance system, that's how it goes, SBSS. And uh, this is uh, now attached to the United States Space First, first Aerial Squadron, right? And uh, that's the Space Force. And uh, we have, of course, these uh, alpha magnetic spectrometers and all of the other things going up at the International Space Station, while China is trying to launch their own. And they start to build these new 20th century capitals 
with you realize that Kazakhstan, where Astana is, which has a giant pyramid of peace that you have to walk through, where they have designed a one world religion where everyone meets around a golden sun table inside of the pyramid. They've developed the one world currency they call Ack Metal, straight out of Mars Attacks. And they've got these blazing twin towers as you walk through the pyramid of peace into Astana, who from the view from satellite is exact sigil of Solomon's seal to bind spirits which is the same seal used to make the Bicentennial Mall in Nashville. And you can see in Canberra the other uh, sigil of Solomon to bind spirits. So they are moving the, the ley line capitals to their new regions. And uh, Astana, Kazakhstan, is a spaceport. Uh, Dubai wants to be a leader in space tourism. They just opened Area 52 in uh, New Mexico, which is the first fully-fledged uh, American spaceport, commercial spaceport, just open. And on top of that, shut down NASA and started the rise of the Dragon, uh, Elon Musk's SpaceX, which launches a Dragon vehicle, a Dragon spacecraft, on a Falcon vehicle, Horus, using Merlin engines, right? Yeah, uh, so now we have the Dragons going up into space, and the NASA astronauts are now interacting with the Dragon. And, uh, and we shot down the Ares, which is the Mars um, Ares program, and went to privatize space programs in the weaponization of space due to the fact that there's this incoming asteroid which is named after the first serpent deity of destruction of Akhenaten which is Apophis and that's the doomsday asteroid that they are now battling and that's where we're at right now. Good day ladies and gentlemen this is Megan Carger with the Kodo Report and I'm happy to come back a second day to Freeman's house here in Kansas and uh, yesterday we were discussing the space wars and what got you into studying the esoteric uh, things that are going on in the world, the, the occult, the hidden, the uh, manipulations behind the scenes. And uh, today um, we'd like to go into uh, Barack Obama, Barack Naughton, a bit of maybe about Disney I know you have to say, so please uh, let's just jump right into this. All right. Well, first what we need to realize is that our world is, our culture is created by weapon systems, by military, military industrial corporations. So as we start to realize that we are just fed propaganda over and over again, we're fed this information that uh, leads us to actions that we would normally be led to. Uh, we were discussing the ideas of Horus and the Horus worship and the, the rising of the crowned and conquering child. Well, in this same scene, they are the idea of Horus is the avenging hero. And so what they began to do for us, and, and around about the year 2000, started to establish the dark hero into our culture. And this came up through the death of Superman and the, the backing, uh, Batman's back being broken. And Batman and Superman were, were killed off in 2000. Now I'll tell you, Disney just spent $4 billion buying Marvel, so realize how powerful this tool is for propaganda. And we'll get more to Disney in there. But as they wanted to institute this dark hero worship into us, they began with the ideas of Batman and Superman. Now Batman's great-grandfather is said to have founded uh, Skull and Bones. Superman is of course one of the Nephilim, the fallen angels. And of course his true name ends with L. And we'll hear Barack Obama even quoting saying that he came from Krypton and his father jor sent him here to save planet Earth. Well this dark hero then, what had happened, they killed off Batman and Superman. Batman was replaced by an angel known as Azrael. And you'll find out that this is the lead angel in the book of Enoch that brought warfare and strife to, to planet Earth. And this new Batman, the Batman 2000, became this vicious killer ripping spines out of people's backs. And the public so disagreed with this concept of Batman, the man that they knew of as the detective, the true uh, human hero. He had no superpowers other than his money and being a son of skull and bones. Uh, he, they could not accept this slasher killer hero and they actually had to have Bruce Wayne fight Azrael to take back over the bat suit because the public wasn't ready for this vengeful hero. Superman on the other side became six clones and curiously enough, the lead clone that they used was one that dressed all in black and carried weapons. Well, what does Superman need with guns? But they were programming the children into this new warfare. 
But Superman didn't take off as clones, and so he was replaced by a new character named Hellspawn. Hellspawn came through Image Comics, and he, he actually is a demon of hell, a dark warrior hero, that then is fighting rapist pedophiles. So now, if you're not reading your children's comic books and not seeing what they are programming into the children's minds for these things, then you don't realize that the bubbling up of culture of Satan is not natural. It's not just an outcome of humans uh, being crazy, or it is actually programmed into the children at a young age through mind pattern programming. And this goes deeper and deeper as you get to the Princess Warrior programming. So what they do as they have the boys conditioned to this dark hero, the war vengeful hero, Horus, then they get the woman and the children, the, the girls, attached to the Venus side or the princess. And so, of course, all of the Disney princesses. And if you start to look into them, you'll find that they have no mothers. Disney princess never have a mother. If you look at even Finding Nemo, uh, the poor little fish's mother is eaten by a barracuda in the first scene. Now, to us, this means nothing, but to a child, this is ultimate trauma-based mind control. And so they are impregnated with this, and then they're actually uh, caught up in product placement because they want to take care of that poor little thing that had its mothers ripped apart by a barracuda. And you'll see this in many of the, data in the Disney films and how this all works. Uh, the little princess sold her soul so that she could sing and walk and go be with a careless man that gave no, no thought about her whatsoever. Uh, she sold it off to the Black Witch. You know, these are the type of programmings that we just take as uh, entertainment. But this is a weapon system. And so the Princess Warrior programming has taken off now. And if you walk into your stores, you walk into your, your Sun Sign or your Pentagram, I mean Target or Walmart, and you walk down your aisles, you're going to find a pink aisle and a blue aisle in the children's section. The pink is all Princess programming. Now, if we look at this just a little bit, like Hannah Montana, Disney's latest, she has now come out as a fallen angel and uh, is now the full-fledged Miley Cyrus. And they, of course, brought her out into the public as this new persona by putting her on a stripper pole on top of an ice cream car at a teen music awards. You know, so they showed the children that here you are, Hannah, Mon Hannah Montana, you're coming out of a trailer and getting on a stripper pole. And this is all produced to you by Teen Music Awards and Walt Disney. Understand what they're doing. So what they've done with Hannah Montana is she's telling you that there's the Miley Cyrus, the little lowly you. And then there's the secret star, the celebrity, Hannah Montana. And never the two shall meet. And so they program into the children the lowly you and the elite so that they can continue on. So that we always see them as real. Because this is their true power. The magicians, as I call them, the sorcerers, they actually manipulate our very minds through making themselves real. Like, what would the queen be without her little orb in her palace? She'd just be another little old lady in her house who would listen to her. But the manifestation of magic is making it real. As Hitler would get all of the people clustered together at night and put on these massive performances with scheduled banners and all of the things to make the situation real and that's their true power that's why they build all the biggest buildings so that they are then absolutely known to be there so we have this princess warrior programming going on that has now conditioned the children into warfare and we're moving steadily towards world war three through a manipulation of the politics and the satanification <laughs> of america if we could put it that way because when you start to look at this picture, and a lot of this culture started to come up and bubble to the surface through a TV series and uh, married with children. And we watched kind of the degeneration of the American culture through the TV station known as Fox. Now, Fox just happens to be the only word in the English language that equals 666 numerologically. F is the sixth letter, O is the fifteenth letter, one and five equals six. And X is the 24th letter, 2 and 4, making 6, so 6, 6, Fox. You even had a Lucius Fox character in your Batman, The Dark Knight. I mean, they are programming this into us. Well, so in walks Barack Obama. Now, the very name Barack Obama in the language of Jesus, in Aramaic, Barack Obama means lightning from the heights. 
Now this is the very description of Satan in the Bible. So now we have a president named after what the appellation of Satan. I mean, if Jesus had said, and Satan fell like lightning, he would say, and Satan fell like Barack Obama. And we, he rides around in a limousine that they call the beast. Now, if you look at this, he clearly, when you take his catchphrase, yes we can, and you reverse that, it clearly becomes, thank you Satan, without even any manipulation. You just flip the audio over, and yes we can, means thank you Satan. Thank you Satan. Thank you Satan. We're gonna spread happiness. We're gonna spread freedom. Thank you, Satan. Obama's gonna change it. Obama's gonna lead them. We're gonna change it. Yes, we can. And rearrange it. Thank you, Satan. So we can see our familiar lines actually run deeper than just presidents and, and oligarchies and monarchies. We can see that our, our bloodlines run through all of the celebrities as well. You can see that Hillary Clinton is not only is related to Angelina Jolie. All right, Hillary Clinton is related to Angelina Jolie who is now a UN uh, special peace ambassador and Brad Pitt is supposedly ra related to Barack Obama. Britney Spears is related to John McCain and Barack Obama is related to all of them through George Bush and Dick Cheney and Hillary Clinton. Well you can see that they've been using you know Hollywood and, and whatnot for a while to directly now um, take people straight out of Hollywood and stick them into politics. Like People <laughs> didn't realize that it was theater after they elected Ronald Reagan, I mean, come on. Right. But if that wasn't enough, they go on and they put Sonny Bono in power. And I've got, you know, I've got Sonny Bono selling his soul to the system, demonizing marijuana in, um, in you know, released uh, National Archives and Records Administration files, which I'm happy to give you a copy of, by the way. And who's running now but Will Smith? <laughs> I'm just waiting for the Smith Schwarzenegger yeah, and the ticket. <laughs> exactly, the Smith Schwarzenegger ticket. It, oh, that would be that would be intense. Our uh, whole show is a parody of existence right now, a parody of reality. It's so surreal; it's hard to even believe. I point out reality to people all day and night, and they think I'm talking crazy talk. Uh, it's it's simply reality. It's well, Tom Lear stopped performing parody after Ronald Reagan was elected because he said that was the point at which parody and reality merged. Well, there you have it. Now, what did Ronald Reagan say to at the UN and many classrooms around the US, but wouldn't it be great if an alien race came down and, and attacked planet Earth and we could all unify under one banner to uh, save our world and let's uh, have some Star Wars. I couldn't help at one point in my discussions with privately with General Secretary Gorbachev, when you stop to think that we're all God's children, wherever we may live in the world. I couldn't help but say to him, just think how easy his task and mine might be in these meetings that we held if suddenly there was a threat to this world from some other species from another planet uh, outside in the universe. We'd forget all the little local differences that we have between our countries and we would find out once and for all that we really are all human beings here on this earth together. Well this was the plan and the operation that was going down. Now we can follow uh, quite a system of, of the plan that's uh, unfolding when you see that Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger had come together to establish the UN regions of America. And so we have the America broken down into ten regions governed by the UN. But it took much time and, and preparation to get this going, and it wasn't until Henry Kissinger, Henry Kissinger got to Canberra and established the Pyramid Palace, the, the Parliamentary House, and now Barack Obama has announced that there are, will be ten regional governors to, to America. So as the story begins to come into play and come under, under the picture, 
we find out that they have this this plan that Warner Von Braun gave us. And Warner Von Braun said, well, first there'll be the Red Scare, and this will help the weaponization of space. And this is what the purpose of the Red Scare was, is to build up the systems to weaponize space. This is what Ronald Reagan was discussing in his Star Wars, or his Space Defense Initiative. Then, Warner Von Braun said that we would use asteroids as the follow-up to terrorism. And after terrorism, asteroids came aliens. And so that's where we're actually at at this moment, because as we can see, Barack Obama was brought into office to foment this space war. Now, Barack Obama, his name meaning lightning from heaven, his phrase, yes we can, clearly saying, thank you Satan, and he's riding around in the beast. Meanwhile, Lady Gaga is performing death and blood, rex death and blood rituals on American Idol. And we are seeing the Satan, Satanization of America so that the rest of the world, when they look over to America, go, well, this is what happens when you give people freedom. They turn into evil Satanists. And that way, they are given the free license to attack America. And they are fomenting this through many ways. Now, first of all, the 9-11 Truth Movement is a, a great way to bring about the downfall of America, if we would have the American Nuremberg Trials. The 9-11 Truth Movement is not just led by Alex Jones or We Are Change, it's also heralded by Hugo Chavez and Ahmadinejad. So realize that this has been a global move uh, to have an open attack on America, and so now we have placed a president into office that no one knows who he is. Now, as I had outlined before, we had the idea of President Bill Clinton being taken down, the man of the people. And then that was taking down the person. The next part was to force in the W, the excrement, the 66. And that was done intentionally to make people angry and lose faith in the system. So first the man, the system. So next the Constitution. And so what you do is you bring in a president that's ineligible. So lo and behold, here comes Barack Obama. And we find out that his name isn't actually Barack Obama, it's Barry Satoro. We find out that he's actually been a student in Indonesia school when it was uh, improper or impossible for an American citizen to be a, a student in Indonesian school. So therefore, he is a non-natural born citizen. Now, he's tried to say that he was born in Hawaii. And they have received so many requests to see Barack Obama's true birth certificate, live birth certificate, that they just passed an, another law in Hawaii that you can no longer ask for Barack Obama's birth certificate. Okay? Uh, this man then is announced as uh, a Kenyan. And they say that if you go to Kenya, you will actually see on the sign into Kenya that it says home place, birthplace of Barack Obama. Michelle Obama actually mentioned the fact that he was Kenyan born while spoke, speaking to the gay and lesbian bi society. Uh, when we start to get the picture all together, we realize that this man is actually just a creation. He's probably not even real. And we're going to understand where he comes from. So he was brought in to institute the space war and also the satanification of America. And, and so therefore, his, all of his names and appellations go to Satan. And then we're also raised in the satanic belief system. And on top of this, we are now battling the asteroid Apophis, who was the first incarnation of Satan, because this was Akhenaten's serpent deity of destruction. So when we flash to our ancient past, we find that monotheism actually bubbled out, out of Egypt by a man named Akhenaten, who most believe, as they study him today, to be an alien. Because Akhenaten was shown to have massive hips, somewhat of a hermaphroditic body, and a massive cone head, as, along with all of his children. And that's, that's not um, much different than um, the South Americans who had the, uh, the habit of binding the skulls of infants so that they would grow elongated in order to honor the gods exactly. who appeared with these elongated heads. And they are finding so many of these skulls in Peru and around there that people are putting up just museums of them. 
of these, uh, yes. And and some of them are quite clearly human, but I, I, I'm telling you, one or two of these have been found that are just wrong to be human. They're, they're, the proportions are wrong and they're way too big even for a bound head skull. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And we have to start thinking that way. That's the, that's where we're at today, is starting to think really like about extraterrestrials and the ideas that are being promoted. Okay, but back to Akhenaten's head. Yes, well Akhenaten, uh, he is a, a true mystery as even Sigmund Freud believed Akhenaten to be Moses. Akhenaten came in and upset Egypt by starting monotheism, saying, You will no longer worship, worship this multitude of gods. You will now worship the sun known as the Aten. But this Aten also had all of the gods incorporated inside of him. And each night, Ra would have to battle Apophis. It was originally known as a pep, but in Greek became Apophis. And I use that term because now Barack Obama is fighting Apophis. Uh, but this is the first creation of the serpent deity of destruction and the idea of monotheism. So uh, then what happens is Akhenaten is completely wiped from history. They erased his name, they buried everything, and this is what allowed Howard Carter to find King Tut's tomb completely intact. Now, King Tut is Akhenaten's son. Some believe that he was killed in order to uh, bring about uh, the transformation back to, to uh, polytheism. Okay. Akhenaten's tomb had not been believed to be found. Uh, there, was, there was a mystery, the KV-55 mystery, that said that they had found Akhenaten and Queen T uh, that found their graves. But they, w they actually cloaked this under national security and would not allow any tests to be done on these mummies, and, and it never was determined whether KV-55 was Akhenaten or not. Okay, so, yes, uh, strangely enough, they put Akhenaten, or uh, mystery mummies, uh, which they called the elder lady and the younger lady, and along with Akhenaten, who, when found, was determined to be female, and then determined to be male, by two separate doctors testing the, the, the mummy right as they, it was found. Uh, they found that the cartouches of Akhenaten had been cleared away, but they found Queen T's toilet there, so they, they assumed that they had found Queen T, which is Akhenaten's mother. And she was an original Nubian princess that came in, and strangely looks amazingly like Michelle Obama. Well, I began to, to uncover the, the coming space war. I, I had gone through the satanic ramifications of Barack Obama, but to me this was just the ritual. What was the truth behind Barack Obama? Well, the truth is stranger than fiction, I'll tell you that. Because what we have found is that mummification saves a viable cell for cloning. We have known this forever and ever, since genetics, since cloning began. That mummification has some special property that we cannot repeat. Right, right now, Lenin is rotting in, in uh, Red Square. Because they don't know how to properly mummify him. And they're trying to determine whether they should bury him now or keep him as a, a rotting icon. And, and it's a big debate. But in ancient Egypt, in 3500 BC, or the 18th century, or the 18th dynasty, uh, they were capable of uh, mummification that saved viable cells for cloning. Well, they also um, had viable mummies found in South America as well. Sure, yeah. yeah. You know, so obviously this is, this is a process that was known by more than one culture that are obviously, you know, quite widely separated by an ocean which goes back to, you know, the potential for there being either, you know, some sort of person teaching both of these cultures or evidence for a global culture, uh, you know, far earlier in our history than they're willing to admit. But back to, back to viable cells. No, you're absolutely correct. Uh, and, and, yeah, <laughs> that's a big part of my study, too, is bringing those two cultures together. Well, they, they put out a show called uh, The Day After People, and they showed us that if the world had died through a catastrophe and aliens wanted to bring us back, this is Discovery Channel, aliens wanted to bring us back, there was only two ways, and that's cryogenically frozen people and mummies. And they could bring both of these back from the dead. So they've been dropping all these codes and, and, and little symbolic gestures to us. And lo and behold, here comes Barack Obama looking exactly like Akhenaten, most especially on his Time Magazine photograph. I've actually taken the face of Barack Obama, split it in half, and put his face with the Time magazine with Akhenaten's face, and you can hardly tell I made the difference. 
I began to question whether Barack Obama was a clone of Akhenaten. As I put this out, and the fact that Akhenaten, or Barack Akhenaten, was fighting Apophis, this incoming asteroid, I put this out to the attention of the public, and somebody says to me, well, did you notice how much Queen T, which is Akhenaten's mother, looks like Michelle Obama? And I said, oh my god. So I put her high school photo, split it in half, put them together. You can't even tell I put her face on it. Most people don't even realize that there's another half of a face there. Well, as we go along and get deeper into our Akhenaten studies, and you see the Stella of Akhenaten worshipping the Aten, he has two daughters with him, and his wife, Nefertiti. Well, the two daughters, uh, we're going, oh, this can't be. We pull up Marita Ten, which is one of the daughters, and the other daughter, I can't find her name, and sure enough, split the faces, they are Malaya and Sasha to a T. We have the entire Akhenaten family resurrected as the Obama first family. And it's interesting because not that long ago I was just speaking with Jordan Maxwell and Jordan Maxwell was talking about how America was designed not only as the new Rome, which is obvious with Capitol Hill, you know, being Capitol Iron Hill and that sort of thing, but that it's of course also designed to be the new Egypt and that's why when when you go along the Mississippi, which is the representative of the Nile, you find Memphis, you find Cairo, you find all of these, you know, names of Egyptian cities. Yes. Yes, exactly. And it's all incorporated in, in the, the Stella and even in the magical designs of the city as Astana and the things that we've been talking about. Because we are ruled by sorcerers. We are ruled by magicians that have ancient knowledge that has been carried forth. You'll find that the Vatican, after 500 years of having an open library, suddenly shut it down. You'll find that um, we're moving into an era where it's possible that they could actually use mind transfer technology coupled with time control technologies to actually send Akhenaten's mind into Obama's body as they had done with Avatar being that he would be the jet right genetic mix for that consciousness to re-embody itself you now have um, Barack and Apophis and this leads us to the space wars, so if we could elaborate maybe a bit more on that, that would be fantastic. Yeah, uh, that's the critical juncture we're at. So uh, we've moved from terrorists to asteroids, Apophis, uh, and they use this to construct the Jet Propulsion Laboratory's asteroid watch. The Russians are launching uh, satellites and rockets to attempt to try to stop Apophis's uh, collision with planet Earth. And they have now launched out so many surveillance systems out into space to try and watch for near-Earth objects. So we just had Mazian Othman, the UN's quote-unquote alien ambassador. Now I say quote-unquote because she absolutely categorically denies that she ever was, is, or will be the alien ambassador for the UN. But they actually announced to her as such and had a major conference with the Royal Society, which is wrapped up in the College of the Rosicrucians. And uh, Mazian Offman comes out to say that she was going to this conference on extraterrestrial civilizations and life that the Royal Society was putting out, but not as the alien ambassador, as BBC announced her, uh, but as the uh, person to speak on near Earth objects. And so these near-Earth objects are now the buzzword all around, but we're moving from asteroids to aliens, so they're intermingling these two stories. So as we watch the alien agenda unfold, first we have the massive fireballs flying over all over the, the U.S. and around the world that are causing sonic booms and earthquakes. And these are very anomalous. Uh, uh, they're supposed to be rare, but I've been tracking them for quite some time now in my Space War News. And what I had done was track these anomalous fireballs that did, had, didn't seem to have a bolide, no rock involved. Every uh, scientist looking at them says, well, we don't know what it is. And the first one I documented was uh, 1999, December, over the HARP facility. And so in my documentary on HARP, I, I show you this. I show you the trajectory of that meteor and uh, the fact that the Anchorage Daily News reported a, a sonic boom and an earthquake. 
and then it happened to go directly over the HARP facility, the High Frequency Active Aurora Research Program, which is actually a missile defensive shield, which is now housed in Cheyenne Mountain, where they filmed Stargate, right? Space Command. Uh, this first bolide, or non-bolide, came in, caused an earthquake and a sonic boom, so I started tracking these things. And as they, they increased to the point where we just had one over Wisconsin that lit up three states. And people are freaking out. But of course, we're not having any impacts. We're not having anything that shows that a rock struck. And we then can compare that with the ideas that I was giving you on the Norway spiral and the cloud of care. And the use of manipulated frequencies coupled with aluminum oxide clouds dispersed out of rockets. Well they suddenly classified those as secret. And you can watch that on my Space War News as that unfolds. Suddenly the, the fireballs are considered a secret subject. And all of the, uh, the astronomers and people that were tracking these sort of things are in up, arm, up in arms about it. So here we are in the midst of that near-Earth asteroid, near-Earth object, uh, weaponization of space. And so what they just did was launch the Space Base Space Surveillance System. And this was launched out of Vandenberg Air Force Base and is now an array of satellites looking for debris in the atmosphere or in the outer space. Well, there's a lot of debris from us still up there. Well, that's right. And that's what they use as, as part of their, uh, their excuse for, for the weaponization of space. But Werner von Braun the Nazi scientist who forewarned this through Carol Rosen uh, said that we were fighting an extraterrestrial source that was coming to perhaps help. He never really elaborated and he constantly mentioned of the universes. And he says when they say the aliens come to attack, I'm going to laugh because they are, it's, it's the opposite. We're attacking the aliens. This is Werner von Braun. Uh, what can I say? But lo and behold, we have the exact war that he is talking about. So now we watch the the beginning of uh, so now we watch the beginning of this next phase, the UFO phase, and what happens is we start to learn of our extraterrestrial past. And I I made note constantly watch Phobos. Phobos is going to play a critical role in this revelation of extraterrestrial civilizations, ancient civilizations, and the whole works. And lo and behold. Buzz Aldrin, after I said all of this on London television, comes out and says, uh, there's a monolith on Phobos. And either the god put it there or aliens, you decide, he says. But now Buzz Aldrin is the 33rd degree mason that brought the Supreme Council of the Scottish Rites flag to the moon with them when they landed. So you can still see that flag at the Temple of the 33rd. Um, so realize who this man is, and he's coming in and he's saying exactly this thing, and all of a sudden everybody's sights are on Phobos. Now, uh, the Russia-China alliance was setting up the Phobos grunt mission, and they were supposed to have launched this year, but they've postponed till next year, and uh, NASA is pushing all of their Mars thing, and now SpaceX with their Dragon is coming up with Mars probes and Mars, uh, uh, well, colonizing Mars is really what Elon Musk is talking about. Well, lo and behold, Phobos, they decide to determine what, what's going on with it. They go up to it with the Mars Observer and use the Marsis, which is kind of a hermaphroditic symbol, Mars and Isis, uh, Marsis, hermaphrodite. Uh, and they, they go and they turn the satellite completely off into a silent running as if they were a sub in wartime. And because all six of the other Phobos satellites have vanished, the last one, Phobos 2, the Russians, took a picture of a 14 mile long craft before losing communication with Earth. And of course, uh, oh, I forgot her name. Uh, the Russian scientist came out and, and showed this picture to the world and said, you know, what is this and why, uh, what is going on with Phobos? So we send up the Mars Observer, it goes around with the Marsis and it takes imagery of Mars from the inside using tomography. And they find that Phobos is actually hollow. And this was the very thing. And they actually mentioned that they would not be able to get a photograph of the monolith because they had to shut down all systems to do a silent running. Very curious stuff. Along with bombing the moon. Now why would you bomb the moon? We launch an a Atlas rocket, Minotaur Atlas, Atlas rocket up to the moon. 
uh, carrying a satellite, the Lacrosse. And well, now the curious thing about the Lacrosse mission. Now, what they had announced was that they were going to launch a rocket to crash into the south pole of the moon to see if there was water, and to also watch the deterioration. But prior to the launch of this rocket, they India had launched their Chandrayaan one satellite and found water on the moon. The Japanese had launched their Kaguya, or what was known as Selene satellite, and crashed it into the moon. And so we had our debris and uh, deterioration already done for bias by Japan and India. And yet America still had to crash a big old rocket into the moon. $79 million to crash this rocket into the moon, or at least that's as much as we heard about. Why would they do this? What would be the purpose? Well. If we start to look at what we have, and we have these antenna arrays that are able to shoot Doritos commercials to Ursa Major, they also are capable of tomography, computer tomography, of seeing within things. So like in Jurassic Park, where they thump the ground to see the dinosaur under the ground, we thump the moon, which all the astronauts have reported rings out like a gong, mm -hmm. and hit it with one of our radio frequency uh, ionospheric heaters, and got tomography of what the inside of the moon looks like. So now it looks like not only do we have, you know, a potentially hollow moon, but that there are more of these hollow moons. And, you know, in terms of, you know, a, a spinning mass, you know, the, the difference between the centrifugal force and the, and the, and the, and the level of gravity is, as, you know, as a spinning mass of something, you know, say a magma would cool a certain amount of the centrifugal force that it's generating while it's spinning, it's going to cool on the outside first and slowly in. And so if it's spinning like that and the gravitational field at the center is not, you know, proportionate to the, to the weight of the, um, or, you know, to the amount of centrifugal force that it's generating, at some point what you're going to end up with is a hollow object. Right, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, which speaks loads to the hollow earth theory, right? I mean, I believe Admiral Bird. I, I believe that science that went on, and, and I believe in this. Well, when you take this to the level of the Egyptian gods, like Akhenaten would worship, and the Ennead, the Nine, they being uh, supposed representations from Sirius, but called the Old Ones that were left hibernating around Saturn. Now, we're talking about faux moons. We have ours, of course, which is completely foreign and, and, and bizarre in all its aspects. But then you have the Mars's moons, Phobos and Deimos, which is fear and panic, right? So they're programming fear and panic. Everything's Phobos, Phobos, fear, fear. And Phobos and Deimos did not appear until 1877. There's not a single astronomer who ever put moons on Mars up until 1877, and then everyone saw them. Prior to that, the only place you would see moons on Mars were fictional works, such as Gulliver's, Gulliver's Travels. Other than that, Mars had no moons. So 1877, the moons show up. At that same time, they established the U.S. Corporation, the Columbia, and they also put Isis's needle in, on the Thames there in, in London on 1877, where they put the Masonic 12-inch rule inside of that. Now, which, which, which moon is the one that's got the belt all the way around Well, that's it? what I was getting to. So now we find out that these Syrian gods, the fish people, the merfolk, were brought here and, and are contained in a, in a moon uh, connected to Saturn. And we find out that as the uh, Cassini satellite came past the Saturn rings and took photographs of the moon Iapetus, it was the Death Star. To a T. It is the Death Star from George Lucas's uh, Return of the Jedi, which was originally Revenge of the Jedi, and they were not ready to plant the vengeful hero yet. Right? So they changed the title to Return from Revenge. Um, they, uh, the moon of Mars, uh, or of Saturn, Iapetus, is the Death Star. You can see the tetrahedral domes, you can see the seal. A 12 mile wide uh, ring around the exact equator. You can see that the craters on the moon are, are falling in in tetrahedral designs. So it's, 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 a, it's a, a, a creation, it's a false moon. And perhaps that's where the gods are hibernating, because it's absolutely ancient and deteriorated, right? So yeah, that's Saturn and the Saturn connection to the Syrians, to the Ennead, the, the nine gods of Egypt. Uh, bizarre story, which is coming to life at this moment. Uh, 
we are starting to see this awakening of Egyptian, Egypt and the Egyptian culture. Oh, Barack Obama went to the, to the Great Pyramids and when he met with Zahi Hawass, the uh, head of the Giza Plateau, the general secretary, he told Barack that he looked very much like King Tut. And they started putting out these pictures of Barack Obama as King Tut. Hmm. And Barack saw actually a cartouche with a, an image of an Egyptian in it with big old ears. And he says, oh, that one looks like me. And this is all after I'd called him Akhenaten. And so now he's in Egypt claiming to look like King Tut, who is actually Akhenaten's son. And I even thought, well, maybe they're trying to cover my story. Because everybody heard of King Tut, but no one knows Akhenaten. And so they associated him to King Tut so that everybody wouldn't learn what I'm trying to tell you, and that is that he's that guy. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I mean, there's, there's got to be a reason for the ancients' obsession with the stars, you know. The buildings are aligned with the stars. Everything is everything. And, and, and the detail in which, you know, they made these calendars, particularly in South America, but, I mean, elsewhere as well you know, indicates that, that there's something more, you know, happening up there than, than modern man wants to acknowledge. And another group of interesting moons would be uh, the ones on Jupiter, you know, Europa, Ganymede, Io, uh, you probably can name them all. I don't think so, but, uh, no? uh, you know, it wasn't amazing that they would announce they found life on Europa. And now we're at 2010, the year we make contact, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and you're looking at, you know, a situation where we know they've got water on, you know, at least one of those moons. Mm -hmm. Well, they know? just found billions on, the, on our moon. Mm -hmm. and, and, and a Goldilocks planet to say that there is other lifelike planets out there that we could inhabit. So as all of this starts to come into the consciousness, that opens the reality of extraterrestrials. But it also, when you take in extraterrestrials, except that if they're here now, they've always been here. We have 14th century paintings showing flying saucers. We've got the ancient depictions. We have aboriginal Ooh, art. Rock and, art, and, yeah. yeah. And, and, and also in, in California and places like that, you know, things that, you know, I mean, I, when you look at, at, at what mankind was painting um, in the very first rock art, they were, they were not... Um, representing things in a way that was abstract. They were representing things quite literally. You know, it's quite, it's quite clear, you know, which ones are deer and which ones are horses and, you know, which ones are different sorts of animals. Um, and in these paintings, these, these rock art paintings are, are very particular. And so when you see certain rock art paintings of things that are appearing over and over again. People have, have talked about, you know, it being plasmic activity in the sky. People have talked about, you know, certain images. But certain images are most certainly, you know, to the modern viewer anyway, what we would classify as either aliens or uh, astronauts. Yeah, absolutely. And all of the sculptures and everything else that I've gone and taken all the photographs of around the museums, you can see this, and this is the new paradigm that they are opening up along with the ET studies. So it's kind of a parallel world that's going right now where we have the ET studies such as the Royal Society's ET conference with Mazzy and Hoffman, the UN. Uh, we have the uh, ET conference coming with, or we had with the Vatican, bringing together all of the ET biologists. And then we have NASA opening up with Lynn to Rothschild as their alien ambassador. And as this story runs along, we have the other story of abductions and the fear of, ang of aliens. We've got all the V coming out. We've got the event on TV. Fear the aliens, fear the aliens, understand the aliens. There are aliens. And then these meet up in two ways in that they're reacting and, and interacting with us now, and they also have interacted with us in the ancient past. In addition to that, it also sets us up for a bunch of humans to masquerade as aliens and pull off the world's largest freaking false flag event. Right, but what if they you know? Were... So it, I, I think I think we've got the potential for for all of the above. Right. Sorry, go ahead. Well, what if that faux alien invasion was actually alien in its origins, but in the ancient past? You see, they lay out a mythos like the Bene Gesserit witches in Dune, that then they fulfill. Mm -hmm. And so we have this whole message to unfold, and now we have Maitreya running around, and I can show you that what they call Maitreya star is actually an experiment or a, a war, 
you remember Goldeneye? That is the, called the New Light Experiment, and, and it's a giant solar array or, uh, that opens up and can radiate the sun down back on the Earth. And when you look at what they call the Maitreya's light, and they look at the New Light Experiment, you'll see that it's actually a satellite transmitting what looks like a star in the sky. So we do have the religion boiling up out of this because it's the Armageddon. We've got the satanic president and the satanic culture of America. We have uh, then the rise of the space war along with the war crimes. So you have the space war is a war crime. Bombing the moon was a war crime. It, it absolutely is forbidden by the uh, UN space war treaty. Right? So we have broken treaties left and right. The, the SALT II treaty was, uh, was busted, the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, when we built a missile defensive shield, removing the concept of mutual destruction. Because if you have a force field, then you no longer have the threat of mutual destruction. You can destroy a, a place and retaliate and not be retaliated on. And that was always our method of keeping the nukes down, right? Yeah, it's just, it's, just it's, it's a matter of insanity. It's like, oh, we can, we can both kill each other, so we'll be safe. Yeah, yeah. But, of course, it's been a plan and an organization simply to create the culture and mindset. As we were run under desks to fear the incoming nuke, the UK has just started UFO crash drills in their classrooms with police officers in the office to show them how to properly investigate the UFO crash. This went on. September 28th kind of opened the door right then. They had a massive uh, press club conference on extraterrestrials attacking our nuclear facilities. They pulled out, I don't remember, about 200 eyewitnesses. It was all broadcast on CNN. And uh, uh, just, you know, that was just you know, a month ago. Uh, just a month ago, they brought, broadcast all of these military, ex-government officials, generals, and everything to tell us that UFO is real, the UFO problem is real, and that they are on top of our nukes, and they are causing so... Oh, yeah, I saw this. I saw this. I saw the, the one guy give the thing about how all the, all the nuclear weapons stood down. No, yeah, that's a whole other... Thing that boiled up in this. Yeah. He was like the face man that went on every news source. And it kind of degenerated what came out of the National Press Club. Because there was this other guy, and I forgot who he is, but I've watched those, and, and yeah, he was kind of the degenerative force. Much like <laughs> we didn't get to Ryle. Ah, uh, yeah, we, we definitely should, uh, should touch on the, on the Raelians. If we look at how they program society, some of it's backwards programming. Instead of making a hero look like a hero, they make them look like a fool. Or their hero, not ours. Okay, so in steps Ra'el, the ambassador of our extraterrestrial gods. Now realize Ra is Lord in Egypt and El, Lord in Hebrew. And we're talking about an Egyptian Hebrew magic that these people are using against us, the Freemasons and other... Uh, secret societies. Ra'el used the, the symbol of massive unification, which was the um, Star of David interwoven with the swastika. And he wanted to place this symbol on an embassy in Israel, which is Isis Ra'el, to uh, await the Elohim's return. Because Ra'el had met Yahweh in a flying saucer in the woods. And had then become the ambassador to our extraterrestrial gods and was there to open the foundations and the communications for extraterrestrials. Well, this guy was, you know, dressed up in a big white puffy space suit with his Star of David swastika around his neck, and he's invited to speak before Congress on human cloning. Now, he brought along and came along with his entourage, and not just his extraterrestrial followers who all want to clone, but the lady who was running the corporation he had founded or sponsored, which is Clonade, and Bridget Pousselet, comes before the world on CNN and announces that she has cloned the first human. And this was around December 25th, 2000. 2000. And what did they call her? But Eve. So now we have the announcement of our first baby clone being born, but we're told by a man in a big white puffy spacesuit, and so no one takes it seriously, no one believes it, and Clone Aid goes on and continues and says that they have now birthed a clone to a, a 
dead boy of a Japanese couple, a lesbian couple that wanted to have their own child, and they've gone on and, and done well, numerous clones since then. <laughs> well, along with Bridget Boussoulet and Rael at that conference in Congress was also Dr. Zavos, and he gave us a big clue. Now, he went on to clone many humans as well, but not to birth. And he had to go do this in Middle Eastern countries because they would not allow cloning in America. Barack Obama steps out onto the stage as I'm calling him a clone of Akhenaten and announces to the world that we will not allow human cloning for reproduction in any way, shape, or form in America. He said it was profoundly wrong and will not be practiced in this society or any society according to him. Here's the president coming out about human cloning and no one noticed, no one saw it. But what he had done was release the restrictions on stem cell research, which truly opens the door to human cloning. But in stating in his legal speak that it was human cloning for reproduction, leaving out the fact that we could now participate in human cloning for experimentation. Or for life extension. And life extension, exactly. Because these people believe in immortality, as we were talking about Cortez. Well, not only that, but if you're, if you're looking at having the ability to, you know... Uh, store and transfer someone's mind, the idea that the that, that's, a, that's a step away from, you know, downloading it into, you know, the next cloned body for yourself. Well, yeah, we can see the downfall in this. You know. But you can see, you can see that, that anything that man can conceive, man can achieve. I mean, this is, this is what they say in the Bible with the Tower of Babel. Sure. Right? They're going to come down and confound our speech because anything that we can conceive given enough time and working together we can achieve it you know we conceived of splitting the atom we worked together we achieved it that was not really the best of goals yeah but unfortunately anything man can conceive they can achieve and and so you know there's a lot of really bad ideas walking around out there that are that are now getting funded and are becoming realities and people like need to... Like artificial intelligent stealth robotic vehicles. Uh, what? You know, what are you going to do with that? Uh, a thing that can think for itself and completely disappear uh, <laughs> and is filled with war. You know, the, they have the Boeing Falcons and they, we're, we're pumping it all into there and that's what civilization does. That's where it goes. It leads us into this war struggle and it creates more machines for more war struggle and they impregnate our minds with the concept that there's nothing but war out in the in the galaxy so therefore we have to prepare for this horrible alien invasion and uh... Yeah, it's as though it's as though, you know, they haven't learned from science fiction. Science, well, they wrote fiction the science, is, fiction. science fiction has given us the submarine and it's given us so many things they write the science fiction then you know you'd think that they would be well aware that what they're creating has they are. the potential That's what to go I'm so That's wrong. why they got six 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 encoded on everything. Yeah, so, they're, so, they, so the 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 intention is then to to create a machine uh, intelligence that wipes out all of humanity or yeah, the Masonic <laughs> chip program, right? Yeah. Well, they had to turn us into the machine intelligence. Yeah, well, uh, all of the above, right? <laughs> They just want a robotic robo sapiens that they can just turn and control yeah. in any method they want. Because it, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a huge theme in, in almost all science fiction. Of course, the the robotic race that turns against their masters and destroys them. Yeah, yeah, you know, Isaac Asimov, H. G. Wells. We get the whole tale. Frank Herbert. Frank uh, Herbert. Yeah. Just about all of them. I mean, I, you uh, know, Battle Arthur C. Clarke, Battlestar yeah. Galactica. Uh, Terminator. Well, back to and Apollo again, you know. Yeah. yeah. It's all there. And, and, and they even say in Battlestar Galactica that it's all happened before and it'll happen again. And that's the same thing they would say in, in many of these esoteric books. And yeah, we could be in this cycle because now every time we reach the limit of time travel, what happens? We go back and write it again and have to live through it all again or however that might work. You know, we're at that level again. Uh, the Anderson Institute is is creating time control technologies, and so now we have space-based weapons, space war going on. H thirty seven, X thirty seven Bs, HTVs. We've got 
um, spaceports opening and, and extraterrestrials are real. The UN, the Vatican, NASA are all telling us so, along with the National Press Club. And we're all just left to deal with what's going on on planet Earth. Well, it makes you wonder when, you know, we'll evolve, you know, uh, collectively beyond our adolescence and stop squabbling like a bunch of children in schoolyards and, 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 and put ourselves in a position where we can evolve together. And, and, you know, I think that that would be my next question for you is, is you know, how do you feel that, that, that we can come together and create a situation where we can grow and evolve together into a more peaceful society? Well, that's been the other half of my experience, right? Uh, the, the synchronistic path, the, the path of gratitude, love, and divine wisdom. Uh, this actually is a path that you can, only, you can only find this state of mind by going within yourself. Because what we realize is that there are all these beautiful, loving, caring, nurturing beings all around us, all the time. No one's jumping you in the grocery store. Nobody's running you down with their car. They will pick you up if you stumble. Thing. You know, humans are inherently good. They have had to use all of this mind control to condition humans to kill one another. Prior to this, when you went to warfare, the men would shoot away and shoot above because they did not want to kill. Yeah, there's, there's, there's evidence to suggest that, um, you know, something like uh, the... the number of people that actually shot in the direction of the enemy was something like 20 percent and that those that shot to kill was actually a significantly smaller percentage and they've got our kill ratio way up but as a result our, our troop suicide ratio has skyrocketed as well because they're now programmed to kill in, in such a way that it becomes a muscle reflex and instead of um, instead of having a situation where they're reflecting before they pull the trigger, they're now reflecting afterwards, and then that's why you're seeing these, these skyrocketing suicide rates. Well, how about this EA, Electronic Arts, EA, the secret name of Enki, put out a game named Rage, which is all about Apophis crashing into planet Earth causing zombies, so you have to get in your little CGI world and kill all of these beings in their war training video games. And EA, Electronic Arts Games, is being bought out by Walt Disney. I mean, you can just look at it. It's right there. It's all written in stone. And they don't lie. They put it right before you all the time. We're capturing your imagination. We're making new memories. We're uh, programming your mind. And, and so when we, what we need to recognize, first of all, is that civilization is not the outcome of human endeavor. It is not the outcome of all of us collectively deciding what the world shall be and what directions it will go. It is the manifestation of a minor few, about 5%, who have that kill shot within them to take the leaps and bounds of programming the rest of society through their magic and manipulation, through their illuminations, and to create the society that we are existing in. They are the culture creators. We are the poor culture that are dealing with it. And so the hardest part for someone like myself and, and you that are bringing the truth to the public as weird as it is, oh my God, you know, vaccinations will kill you, doctors are killing you, uh, you know, the whole list of uh, contrivances, don't drink the fluoride and all the things that we could scream and cry about, chemtrails over our heads, ionosphere heaters causing earthquakes and floods, oh my. Uh, we also have to know and understand and share with the rest of the public that this is a show, it's a facade, and that when you actually look around at humanity, you find loving, caring beings. You find people that have no will to kill, have no will to, send, to take the power and the domination that the psychopathic elite do, and that we are all just being conformed into a mentality through acts of prestidigitation, stage performance magic, and contracts and talismans. Now, contracts and talismans are the two basic forms of Egyptian magic. Once you start to look into that, you see that money and corporations are nothing but magic. It's a pantacle, the money. It's a spell. It has no foundation. It's all a belief system, along with corporations, which are simply a contract. And a contract is merely a, a magical communication with the ether to say that we exist. And now we've manifested these golems, these immortal beings, that have all the rights and privileges of a man and a woman. And yet, here we are with 
corporations and all of their signs and sigils all around the globe and we're trying to believe once you find out that they're all masons at the core that this is the outcome of human endeavor it's not so the answers lie in our recognition of this that this is not we we are not this team and we're actually under the influence and should be kind of angry but you can move through your stages of grief and you take it upon yourself to start to realize that the other humans are your only currency they are your hope and your energy and so with the other humans in mind you work on your own control dramas and you find the ways that you have been psychically sucking energy off of everyone else and you learn how to withhold that and instead project your gratitude love and everything you've got to them so that they can raise their vibrations so we have been conditioned to psychically suck everyone's souls because we no longer have beauty in our existence and beauty comes from seeing two lovers meet to seeing babies with puppies you know the one things that bring tears and goosebumps to your body we've forgotten all about that and this Venusville in our Venus Lucifer society we have then have to recondition ourselves to love one another right that's the hard part because the mind pattern programming is telling you fear fear these evil humans they're gonna eat you right and this is not the truth once you develop that within your soul you'll find synchronicity start to unfold before you and you will start to become part of a destiny and your true soul's purpose will start to be fulfilled instead of this manipulated purpose money came in and said we are gonna take away your divine gratitude because divine gratitude comes when you have a miraculous event that gives you the the deer that walks before your spear or in modern terms the friend that comes and shares what he, you need uh, we have now seceded the idea of gratitude with money saying I deserve this I have earned this pantacle and therefore I can have this I want I want and it's this desire pride and and yearning for this uh, false reality that has put the stumbling block into humanity people say that the love of money is evil I see money as evil anything that you can pay someone to do an evil deed with as sinister uh, origins but even outside of that concept money takes away your very gratitude and when I spoke with the Mayans at the pyramids, and when I went to their all-night ritual, they showed us that gratitude was the solution. This was their answer. They brought together a tribe of nations, a collection of, of everyone. We had everybody from every continent, and yet none of us had planned that. And we show up at the meeting, and they say, oh my God, our prophecies were, refill, were fulfilled. And we perform this ritual to the ancestors and gratitude to the, the earth and, and love and nature but of course just prior to us showing up George W. Bush had shown up and they told us many tales of the dark black dragon that flew over the skies when George Bush was there and when we finished the ritual the sun did not rise it went all night long but the the morning was completely fog clevered and the sun couldn't be seen until one in the afternoon or later and they felt this was a complete foreboding sign and they actually were selling off their property around the lake Adalon uh, which is a bottomless lake that houses a sea monster to the gringos to, to say here you 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 take our <laughs> this land it's all gonna be underwater they're certain that there's major catastrophes on our way but they were also as certain that if we as a people gather together in ideas of gratitude and ceremony in any way shape or form we could lessen the vibrational shift that we're going through and bring about a better uh, tomorrow through our very soul potentials we look at the work of men like um, Dr. Masori Moto who studies uh, how the non-physical affects physical and um, and so he did the uh, series of experiments with water. He wrote a book about it called The Message in Water. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about love and gratitude. And the interesting thing is that the um, there's a kanji that means both love and gratitude. Hmm. And that this particular um, thought pattern seems to produce the most beautiful effect of all of them wow. in the water. And that's it. The crystallization of our culture, if you will. 
And no one believes it's possible. They don't believe that humans could be good and that if uh, there weren't these rigid control centers that we would all tear one another apart. But I challenge everyone and anyone to try it. And it's hard if you have no love of your fellow man. If you take a pilgrimage and you just take a walk across the world, across the U.S., wherever you're at, and you take this pilgrimage and you watch as it unfolds before you, and then you start to recognize the synchronistic beauty of life, then you can see that this experience is real. Otherwise, synchronicity is so personal that you can't prove it to another human without them going out and seeing it for themselves. Well, it's been an amazing, amazing synchronicity, you know, and that, um, that you and I both know Max, and Max has introduced us, and so thanks to, um, to Max Egan, and, and as most especially thank you to you, Freeman, for all of your incredible hospitality and for spending two days talking to, uh, to everyone who's going to listen to the Kodo Report. Uh, really, it's been brilliant. I've been loving it very much. Fantastic. And, uh, Go off and have some more tea. I think that's a perfect plan. <laughs>